Okay. Ugh. All right. So, um, Berto and I just recorded <laughs> the beginning of an episode on toxic masculinity. In which we got very toxic masculinity. <laughs> Literally a half an hour about. Berto and I got so angry at each other and so toxic masculine with each other and literally fighting and it wasn't bad i mean it, it was just I, I didn't feel threatened by you Berto. and we've been in you know debates i didn't feel like the finger in the face finger, no there was no finger in face no it didn't it didn't have that energy no i, I was getting increasingly frustrated and I, and I thought you know i just scrapped the whole episode and then we continued talking oh. about it and then i started to cry a little bit and say you know, I, I'm frustrated. I, I don't know what to do here. I, I want my my normal best friend podcasting vibe. <laughs> and then you started to cry too. Yes. And I might like really, really cry. It's just ironic that in <laughs> an episode ironic. on toxic masculinity that we start the episode <laughs> by crying. Uh, I love you. You're my brother from another mother. I love you. You're my brother from another mother. <laughs> and uh, I don't like to fight with you and... I respect your brain. I respect your your wisdom, but you were effing annoying when we recorded this episode at first. So let's start over, Berto. What do you say? Mm, let's do it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirkonda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Who are you, Berto? My name is Umberto Castaña, and I think I still grow corn with genetic defects in it. So, Berto, quick questions, quick answers. What is masculinity? It is the set of traits that are part of being a male of the species. What's toxic masculinity? It's when those traits get out of hand and you can hurt yourself or others. What is positive masculinity? When you leverage the traits to uh, make yourself or others better. What are the consequences of toxic masculinity? It can include ostracizing members of society, hurting them, violence, violence against uh, women and others. What do conservatives say about the concept of toxic masculinity? They probably believe, many probably believe it's stupid. What problems do feminists blame on toxic masculinity? Things like uh, abuse, uh, rape, harassment. What's one example of toxic masculinity in TV and movies? Uh, Gordon, Gordon Gecko in Wall Street. Greed is good. You should crush your enemies. See and driven before you. <laughs> what about top positive masculinity from movie and TVs? Like Jerry Maguire, top hotshot agent, but yet, you know, masculine dude. But at the same time, he like has a sensitive side and he, you know, he falls in love with a, with a gal and her son and is a good parent role model for him. Yeah. Uh, did I say TVs? That was weird. Um, what should we do, you and I, about all this stuff? We should um, make sure we understand what we mean by it and we should set a good example. Well, that's what we're going to talk about today in detail, all these things. I got a lot of notes on toxic masculinity. I looked up various different definitions. Some I resonated with, others not so much. Most of them I did not because I found them to be a little too specific. Um, but first, Berto, uh, I've already asked you this in the previous recording when we scrapped it, but, but you can just answer the same way that you answered last time. When did the term first emerge in our culture? 70s? Close, 1980s. And who do you think it emerged from? What sort of groups? I would imagine it was like second wave feminists. It was not. It was within men's groups uh, uh, at the oh. time in the 80s. Yeah. Like supporting each other, like men's groups? Yeah, like men evaluating how gender socialization has harmed men. Like and Mitko groups, uh, incel groups? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so my definition just boiling all the different concepts into three words is harmful masculine norms. So harmful meaning harmful to the self or others or as at a societal level or the environment, I suppose. Masculine meaning uh, the, uh, associations with men and norms meaning the norms that we teach people like it is the norm to say thank you when someone gives you something or please when you're asking. These are norms that we teach people and uh, and we teach norms associated with masculinity and some of those are harmful. What, harm, what uh, toxic masculinity is not is anti-male, which some people will say. What do you think the internet and the incel people think about the discourse around toxic masculinity being anti-men. What do you think, Berto? 
Yeah, I think the, so I personally don't love the term because it's got the word masculine in it. And so it already, I think, sets some people against it for the wrong reasons because they hear toxic masculinity and they're like, oh, it's against men. Um, And it sort of is because we're the ones in charge and we're the ones with all the power historically. So yeah, but I would... I would like to think that they're being a little misguided about that aspect. In general, they then go all the way to the other side and they're like, they want to eliminate ma- male and ma- and men and make us make us little feebles. Right. And it's similar to the word feminism, right? That some men mistake feminism for being women are better, for example, right. Right. or let's exclude men. Or Black Lives Matter means, oh, right. now they only care about black lives. Right. No, that's not what it's saying. It's interesting, I think, that's that a lot of men have trouble with just the word feminism. Like, right. uh, it kind of proves the point that you can't say I'm a feminist because it has feminine, which is associated with women. You know, I, I just I just find it just a, a, another example of like of sexism and right. misogyny in, in our culture. But anyway, so just getting to the, what someone said on the internet about this. Feminism and the discourse around toxic masculinity is not about equality. It's always been about retribution. They want women to have 100% authority and 0% responsibility, and men to have 100% responsibility and 0% authority. And it's working well. Women can put men in jail for any reason with no evidence. Brito, what do you think they mean by that? Women could put men in jail for any reason with no evidence. And I think they're talking about the whole, like, uh, you could sue for alimony payments or you could say, hey, that person looked at me funny. So then they get put away for life. Right. And that's what like the red pill, the yeah. incel, the MGTOW yeah. people. Yeah. Are there examples of that? Yeah. Uh, there are examples of women accusing men of things that were false and putting them in jail for you know decades for things that they didn't do. But that is not the norm. It's not a very typical Absolutely. thing. And I find it incredibly ironic that these men are uh using these grievances like we are oppressed we are we are this like defenseless people being hurt by all these women uh when they themselves would look at that and be like oh that's not a very masculine trait you know it's just ironic they're like "Eh." yeah and whenever the privileged is challenged about their privilege this is the one of the top five responses you know like i remember you know, as a brown person, Berto as a brown person in the United States, there was a point, a tipping point in the United States when whites were less than 50% of the demographic, right? Yeah. It was like, what was it 10, 20 years ago or something? And there was this utter panic, <laughs> like, oh my God, or like, you know, a war against Christmas when uh, oh, Christmas, right. when, when Christianity is only 75% adhered to in the United <laughs> States instead of 90%, that suddenly it's like, oh, we're oppressed. It's like, how is 75% or how is 49.5% of the population suddenly a minority? The rest of the minorities are in a bunch of little groups, you understand? Right. Like, there's not a lot of half Japanese, half white people in the United States, you know what I mean? So uh, when men are challenged about their privilege, they it. but I get it, you know, it feels, because relative to the power they had 20, 40 years ago, it's a loss of power. Yeah. And it, so you only feel the deficit, right? It's sort yeah. of like in physics or in biology, when you have a super cold hand and you put your hand in lukewarm water, it feels hot, but it's right. actually uh, lukewarm, you know what I mean? So I think that's what's happening. And all you gotta do is stick your, take your head out of your ass and look around and go, oh, actually I'm being I'm I'm being brought down to like normal levels of power instead of the astronomical levels of power I had before. Or you could be like Paul Atreides and keep your hand in the water. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other thing that they think feminism and the discourse around toxic masculinity is doing is making men into women. Right. What do you think this is about, Berto? Yeah, basically, it's like the self-fulfilling narrative of, okay, they want us to not be so male and they don't define what they mean because like if they did, it gets a more, like a more awkward conversation because if they define it to like, they want us to not hit them and abuse them and rape them, right? Like all of a sudden you're like, well, yeah, maybe we shouldn't do that. Mm-hmm. But instead it's like, they want us to not be male. So they want us to become female. Right. And that's not what the discourse around toxic masculinity is about. And that's why I want as two men who I, I would say we're actually 
fairly masculine presenting. I definitely am not all the traits, but you know, yep. captain of the football team, I stand tall, I talk loud, I like to be in charge, I That's right. say what I want to say, I get angry, you know, uh, not that women can, and I want to say that from the beginning is all the things we're talking about does not exclude women. Anyone can be anything they want. That's kind of the point, but th there are socializations that we give people. And wh wh what I also say from the beginning is that uh, who knows where we'll be in 50 years, but right now we're at a place where people can identify of various different genders, right? Yeah. And I like to identify as a man. Like it, right. it feels congruent to me for the most part. Like, Dude, I'm super like man. Like, look, I drink chocolate martinis, dance salsa. Sing a karaoke all Well, the salsa time. in your <laughs> neck of the woods was very... It's actually very sexist. <laughs> it's very masculine, right? Uh, it's both. It's actually... I will say dancing in Colombia is is actually a fairly equitable thing. Surprisingly, because you think, oh, the male leads, but they, it's not real. Like, both partners are supposed to be really good at it and in charge, both of them. So we have a quote here from the internet. We need to eradicate toxic masculinity is what they always scream. Well, it now seems they are realizing the consequences of trying to turn men more feminine. Shouldn't have tried to create so many femboys if you didn't, if you don't really want sensitive men. Um, so yeah, there's so many <laughs> weird things in here. Like one, trying to uh, tell boys and men to sift through masculine traits and discard the negative ones and hold on to the neutral and positive ones is not turning men more feminine. It's right. just asking people, men in particular, and by extension, everyone really, yeah. to evaluate how they've been socialized and what part of those socializations are negative and which ones are not, right. and, and discard the ones that are negative. And since men have been in so much power over so long and have so, still have a lot of power, our toxic traits cause so much more damage is yep. the thing. Um, the other thing that they will say is that it's a conspiracy against men. For example, one person says on the internet, feminism is the prime weapon of the communists. What do you think about that, Bertle? I know of very few female leaders of communist countries, number one. <laughs> uh, number two, I don't understand what it has to do with it. Like, because even if you were being very academic about it, which I doubt that we are being academic in these contexts, the communism thing is supposed to be like, okay, we get through these periods of strife and at the other side, everyone is equal. So I guess if everyone is equal, they see that as feminization. Maybe that's what they, they're talking about. If everyone's equal, then we're all just fe feminine. Right. And uh, maybe on that point, it's not about erasing your personality differences. Like, I like to go fishing or I like to always be the one driving the car if I had a choice if other people would be cool with it. Or I like to stay home with the kids. You know, like it's not about erasing preferences or life choices. It's about giving people the flexibility regardless of what they are, who they are, what gender they are, to be able to choose for themselves without outside influence, without outside ideas about who should be this and who should be that. Absolutely. And, and, and then I would even just get like, if I could only die on one hill here, it would be like, well, fine, let's, I'll even leave that fight for another day, can we at least not hurt, abuse, you know, uh, harass, you know, from these positions of power? And because the, the thing that gets lost in this argument, oh, they're trying to, again, if, if those discussions were being had with the definition of what we're talking about, like, oh, they just don't want us to grab their tits at work and insult them and slap their ass and then go in the back room and rape them, all of a sudden that conversation gets a lot more difficult to have and awkward. Instead, they hide all that aside, they put all that aside and they say, oh, they just want us to cry more at movies. All right. It's like, wait, like that's, that's level 59 after like the first 6,000 levels. Well, or even more ridiculous, they're just like, they want us to be submissive. You know, they, yeah. they want us to give them power. They right. want us to, let them walk all over us, right. which is like, how did you get there? From right. from us talking about socializing boys into believing that emotions are not okay, how did you make the leap into saying, we're trying to tell men 
that they should let women walk all over them and that women should be able to put men in jail for no reason. Like, how how did you make that leap? Well, and there's also this very confusing thing that happens, which is that on the one hand, they say, oh, you know, women, they go around pretending they want like a sensitive guy and someone who cares about them, but then they go out with the assholes. Right. Implication being, I'm not an asshole and I'm sad because women are not going out with me. But in the next breath, they'll say, but they're trying to turn us not into assholes. Right. It's such a weird narrative and ideology that is in the incel and MGTOW and pickup artist community. That whole thing is like, and, and I've had clients, we've talked about this before. I've had clients who told me all about it. And I was just like, how in the world did you download that weird rigid narrative into your mind? And it's so prevalent. And we've gone into that discussion. Maybe we'll get into it later, but um just let it be known that there's a lot of it's sort of like how there are pockets in white supremacy uh, severe white supremacy who would call themselves white supremacists i suppose there where they develop very weird ideologies yeah like that they're they're the superior race or that uh you know i don't know i could go on and on but i i think it's pockets within pockets (laughs) yeah and and on the bright side that I look on, it's that when we see that happening, the incel community, for example, that would never have existed 50 years ago because we didn't need it 50 years ago. Uh, absolutely. And and I will say that there's another aspect here that we shouldn't just talk about that, that incel MGTOW thing because there's a whole other side who would absolutely not categorize themselves as incels or MGTOWs or anything like that but that they believe that men should be hyper-aggressive. Totally. They should be in the boardrooms only, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, women are too emotional. I mean, I remember when Mondale and Ferraro were running for president and vice president, a woman running for vice president. A lot of people forget that that happened in the 80s, <laughs> uh, way back then. And she was the VP candidate? Yeah, okay. Ferraro. Everyone talked about, well, what if Mondale, Mondale right. dies and she becomes president? You know, women, you know, what about when they're on their period? Right. They're too emotional. She's going she's gonna to press the button and, and nuke the, the USSR. And that was told to me unironically in the 80s. That yeah. was said to me as if, well, that's a fact. And, and I'm, I don't remember specifically, but I bet you many women believe that to be true as well because they were, you know, they had internalized sexism. And so anyway... Uh, The other idea that people will say is that the discussion of toxic masculinity condemns masculinity in general, which is not true. We've already covered that. Also, what some people will say, which is actually kind of true, is that the discourse around toxic masculinity lets men off the hook because then men can just blame socialization for their behavior, for their bad behavior. What do you think of that, Bruno? Yeah, I actually, I see this point a little bit more. In fact, part of the reason I dislike the term, because whether you think it's genetic, socialization, a mix of both or whatever, you, you don't want to have it be a, a scapegoat. Like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, boys will be boys. What are you going to do? Yeah. And so instead, I mean, it's, I look at it more as like, let's label something because that way we can talk about all the bullet points under that label but in the end really it's bad behaviors are the important part here and those bad behaviors are bad because they're destructive to others and they they're destructive to society and so no there's no excuse (laughs) yeah it's like same thing with like going to jail you don't get to not go to jail just because like you know you had some predisposition to something and it's like yeah it's the the same thing here well and that's a good example that you know, we could look at a criminal who murdered someone, say they held up a 7-Eleven and shot the guy because he, they were just wanted to get the money. Uh, you wouldn't say, you know, you can't as a criminal say, well, I had a bad childhood. I it's was like, socialized this way. Yeah, or I was socialized, toxic masculinity, or my neighborhood was, was really tough. You know, we wouldn't say that, okay, well, then you now can escape the law. But right. at the same time... <laughs> societally and if we're going to fix the prevalence of these kinds of behaviors uh, addressing these factors is extremely important and probably the most useful i mean just yelling at people and putting them in prison clearly does not deter people from committing crimes absolutely and i think that is why it's important not to lose that in this conversation which of course neither you or i are doing but if someone out there is quote-unquote yelling at men I think that's the wrong approach as well. Right. Uh, now, 
there's times to yell at certain men when they do certain egregious things for sure. Um, but like with the robber example, what we do or what we should do, I should say, we're terrible at this in society. What sh- we should do is say, absolutely, Mr. Uh, robber, you are right. We have failed you as a society. Right. Unfortunately, you still have to pay some consequences. But we are working hard to fix society so there is less of your situation. Right. <laughs> and 99% of the people that went through the same circumstances did not kill a guy the same way. Exactly. Yeah. But, but they were factors yeah, in that. They were yeah. Factors, yeah. Okay, Berto, let's talk about toxic traits and positive traits of masculinity. Let's start with toxic traits. Berto, lay it on me. All right, toxic traits, I think hyperaggression. Okay, tell me, how are we socialized? Maybe not you and I, but like boys in no, general. No, I think, well, I was certainly, look, I grew up, and we all grew up watching, like what we do is, we go fight. Arnold we're gonna Schwarzenegger. Kill him. Yeah. We're gonna take revenge. We're gonna load up on all our guns and goddamn it. Now, what and it else? was it was rarely women that were in those depictions. Well, and I'd say even when there were women, it was I, I guess I would say a little bit masculinized yeah. in a sense, right? Like Sigourney Weaver, you know, grabs all the guns and she's gonna go kick ass. Right. Now there are two aspects to it. One is like we did see that it was like the usually the underdog that gets that. But the bigger message was, we are supposed to be fighting, we're supposed to be at war, we're supposed to be killing each other. Yeah. And, and, and in all metaphors of it, right? In the boardroom and- yeah. yeah. And to avoid that when the need arises or when faced with that as a option, makes you not a man. Right. Makes you not a good enough man. Like if, if you're a good enough man, you will rise to the occasion with ultra violence you know and, yeah and and look it, so it was impossible in history to survive sadly sitting there being nice to people because they would come raid your village try to kill everyone but now we don't live in that situation yeah so this is the time to have these conversations yeah we don't have to go out and kill each other right as an example of this i, I thought about uh, this moment that was, I don't know, it would have been like 25 years ago. I, would, I was in my mid-20s, and I'm at a bar with all my buddies. You know some of them, Berto. And there was probably like, no joke, like 25 of us at this at Goldie's on 45th, <laughs> yeah, next to the old uh, Guild 45th oh, yeah. uh, movie theater. Anyway, where we saw Darjeeling Limited one mm, time. Yes. Anyway. I used to live nearby there, and I was in there with like 20, 25 of my friends, and these are uh, frat fraternity brothers of mine, and I mean, they weren't, we were the nerd frat, so we weren't (laughs) like large, but we definitely would get in fights with other frats sometimes, Mm -hmm. you know, we were used to, as a group, fighting other people, you know, and- Boys will be boys. Right, and you can't be, do they say simped? Is Is that a thing, to be simped? Or to simped. be a to be a simp on the internet. Oh I, yeah, yeah, simp. Yes, I've heard that. Like you're this, you're submissive, or you know. Yes, that's anyway. That's like, right. um, so I'm at this. We're at this bar, and, and I went there I, for a while. I went there every Thursday night, like with my friends, and we were playing pool, and we would always play pool. And there was a whole system. I don't know if in other towns we do this, but you put a quarter up to claim the next game, and it was all honor system, you know. So. If there were four other quarters on the on the pool table and you put your quarter, you just kind of know. Well, I must be fifth in line there somewhere. Yeah. And as a as a the quarter owner, you kind of have to keep an eye on the pool table to to see like uh, when your number when comes up. up yeah. You, yeah. And so there was this um, uh, group of guys playing at the two pool pool t- tables, and uh, I put my quarter up. And then a, a while in, I, I noticed they they hadn't come over to to talk with me, and it was the same guys, which oh, was they weird. Just kept playing. Yeah, they just kept playing. And so I went over there and, I, and politely said something like, "I I think um I think I must be next or something," you know, mm-hmm. even though I thought they already passed me over. And they're like, "Oh yeah, whatever." And I'm like, "Okay, well I think I, I think I'm next because it's been a while since since I put my quarter on here." And they're like, "Okay, whatever." And I and I you know leave and I figure, well now they can't like not honor yeah, yeah. the honor system here, you know? Yeah. And so they, uh, you know, I'm keeping an eye and I see they, the, the game ends and uh-huh. I'm just kind of waiting and they say nothing and they just start again. Oh my God. And so I'm like, okay, 
Um, and then I went over there a while later. I said, so I'm pretty sure I'm next. You know, so I, 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 you I gave them plenty of outs, gave them plenty of, I don't want to get in a fight. Yeah. I don't, why would I want that? And then, um, you know, more beers in, uh-huh. uh, hanging out with my friends. I'm starting to kind of tell my other friends like, Hey, those guys are being dicks about yeah. it. I go over there and, uh, like a couple more times. And I'm like, look, we're next. So after this game, before I finish my sentence, he just starts screaming in, in my ear, like, like a centimeter away from my lawsuit, from my face, just screaming at me. You know, you know, you better f and I'm gonna kick your f and blah blah. You know, <laughs> I'm just oh reminded of that one scene from It's Always Sunny where Charlie Day is like. All right, well, you know, go ahead and F yourself in the B and F your A and, and you know. <laughs> and Max like, did he just say C and your and Dennis is like, yeah, don't even. Don't you know. even try to unpack it. <laughs> but so he's screaming at me and now the entire bar, oh my which is, God. you know, dozens of people are just looking at this large guy screaming and I'm not small, yeah. you know, and he's screaming in my ear. And I remember looking around the because that's my response when stuff like this happens. Is I just I get super calm. Yeah. I'm. I just kind of started looking around, like kind of rolling my eyes, uh-huh. like look at this guy. Uh-huh. And so I walk away, and I am seething. Of course. And at this point, oh my god. So logically, from a non non emotional and non toxic masculine or even any kind of masculine standpoint. I guess I'm just not playing pool tonight. I don't care. I don't need to play pool. Right. You know what I mean? I'm hanging with my friends. Uh, there's dartboards. There's clearly something wrong with this dude. Yeah, there's something wrong with something. Something's up with that guy yeah. and his friends, but particularly that guy. And th- I can only lose, you know, yeah. if, I, if I fight him, <laughs> you know, that's only what? Like, and then I get to play pool because I because I risked life and limb <laughs> to, to, for everyone. I risk going to prison, you know what I mean? If I, and then you get to play pool. <laughs> yeah, just just because I get it. I get I play pool all the time. I don't care, you right. know? And it's it's I'm not here to do that necessarily. The only reason why I would go over there is for what, Berto? For your honor, the masculine honor. Masculine honor. You don't want people to think that you're a pussy right which is what it's a female body part exactly you you don't want to be a girl you don't not even a girl a female a part of a female right so you're going to be a man you're going to stand you're going to have balls all That's these right. words you're Big not going to be balls. a pussy you're going to have dick balls. energy right by the way trigger alert trigger warning for everyone on various levels but and i sat there and i did a political campaign with all my buddies of just like now is the time we are going to go over there and we are going to rock them. We, I mean, they, he thought I was alone. I'm here with 25 yeah, of my yeah. frat brothers. That guy is, is going to get dragged outside and beaten. We're going to beat all five of those dudes oh my God. into the ground. We're going to take him. I'm going to, I'm going to drag him outside and we're all just going to wail on these guys. And then we're going to, find their cars and we're going to smash their I mean I was yes your honor I I did key their car after beating them yes <laughs> <laughs> you know long story short there was a couple of scuffles it didn't amount to anything and this is 25 years ago and this moment is burnt in my brain <laughs> right because of the adrenaline because of the honor the toxic masculine ideas in my head of you cannot be, you know, uh, baited like that. Right, you right. can't be made into a simp like that. You cannot be um, uh, overpowered like. And all he did was present himself as a very unreasonable, weird person who was extremely territorial about a goddamn pool table in a public bar. You know what yeah. I mean? Like he's the one that made a fool out of himself. But for but because he screamed at me and he dominated me verbally, and I never dominated him verbally or physically. Right. And he dominated the pool table because that happened, it is a lightning bolt of pain and shame yeah. through my masculinity. The gorilla the silverback gorilla. It's just ridiculous. Well well it 
so <laughs> we might disagree on this point, but I do believe that there are some uh, learned behaviors from millions of years there as well, flight or flight. You sure. Know? Uh, did we evolve a mechanism as humans to protect our territory yeah. from other hunter gatherers? Yeah. Uh, could be. Yeah. You know, it seems seems likely, and not just humans. And like we see it animals. even even with chimps and bonobos. Yeah. They will when they encounter another, which are our closest cousins. It's impossible to know if they have a similar culture, but when they encounter similar tribes, there's there's sometimes there there's a usually a posturing of, hey, you know, get away. This is our territory. And then if that doesn't work, then sometimes violence yeah. occurs. And even when it's violent, it's like short bursts, hoping that it's like, you know, because there's this tension between I want to destroy you, but I also don't want to risk destroying me. <laughs> and so genetically and, you know, psychologically, but, but yeah, so, uh, you know, were our humans from that likely were men given a little bit more of the oomph around that? You know, maybe. Well, I mean, I was just watching a documentary about uh, Aborigines in Tanzan Tanzan Tanzania, and they still hunt uh, all every day, right? So, like, their whole life is hunt. That's it. The males. The, the males hunt. And in this case, they're running out of things to hunt, so now they're hunting baboons. And, dude, it's like kind of humans going against other primates and it's very vicious and brutal but they're not doing it in a sort of in a mean evil way they're just like we need food but they go they kill them and they have to watch that they don't get killed and hurt and and so they're playing that out every day where it gets we have turned it into these weird like pool tables no one has to survive over pool tables no <laughs> like what the hell um, so for animals, it's just a matter, it, it's it's a daily life, right? I, I have to eat here, protect this, that. For us, we have so much culture, so many metaphors in our lives. And then we don't even know how, what to do with all these remnants from before. Yeah. You well, know. and anyway, the yeah. point is, is that if I were uh, my wife, uh, Stacy, who is socialized as a girl, uh, because, you know, uh, she, she was, you know, identified as a girl growing up that she in that situation, I guarantee you would have reacted completely differently and and wouldn't have remembered it as well because it wasn't it wouldn't shame her sense of self-worth in that moment. You know, for her, if she were in that situation, she would have won, you know, gone over there, put her quarter down and then maybe ask nicer, you know, cause that's the other thing. I probably wasn't super nice when I walked over there, you know, but who knows? And then if there was any resistance, she, she would have just given up. She'd be like, well, I guess we're not playing pool. And if I were standing next to her, I'd be like, well, that's, that's a bunch of bull crap. You know what I mean? And, and how is that different? Is that because of genetics? You know, hard to know. We definitely know it's a part of socialization that I was taught that to be a proper man, you know, and the more I get into these the discourse around around gender socialization, toxic masculinity, part of it, the more I'm like, oh yeah. I mean, the, there's these rules that are passed down uh, to boys, and you were raised mostly in Bogota, but you know, partially in the states as well. And um, but I but I can speak for me is that. Like one idea that really resonated with me, that's a toxic masculine idea, which is that if anything you do is associated or you're accused of anything that's associated with a woman or a gay person, then you are not a man and you're a terrible human being. Mm -hmm. You know, like there is simply something deeply wrong with you. Yep. If you exhibit anything that could be mistaken for a woman, That's there right. is deeply something wrong with you. That's if, right. And gay would, you know, because back in the old day, we we thought gay people were, were just women. Do you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, absolutely. It, so me and my friends, absolutely, when, when I was growing up in Colombia, uh, if you wore or said or did something and it was like considered feminine, that was a no-go. Right. And you would get made fun of. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. You get targeted for bullying. You would be ostracized from your group. And then by extension, you know, when I think about 
all the ways in which men as groups, and I've been a part of many men groups, you know, friends, there's a constant signaling to each other, virtue signaling, you, if, if you will, of we are men, we are not women. I am a man, are you a man? Right. Like all these, and, and, and the shorthand to this that is at least in Seattle men culture is jokes about, uh, jokes about rape, honestly. Uh, well, well, cause, cause, and, and, cause I, for a long time I'm like, why do some people think rape is funny? Like, I don't understand that. Right. But, cause it's not funny. <laughs> but when I think about, okay, humor is tragedy averted, right? Yeah. So the Pratt fall, someone falls, yeah. you know, uh, uh, Wiley Coyote runs into the, the cliff and blows up, but then in the next scene, he's fine. You know, yeah. he didn't actually, if Wiley Coyote died in one of those scenes <laughs> and was just like, didn't go to the afterlife, it just, it wouldn't be funny. You know, no. it'd just be like, well, that's just tragedy. Yeah. But tragedy averted is, you know, a bunch of guys talking about raping women and joking about it. And it's tragedy averted because you're talking about it and no one can get you in trouble because you're amongst men. Right. And you're amongst bros who understand that we all agree that we're better than women, that we, we're not going to really rape them, but we know it's okay for us to talk about it. It's okay right. for us to assert dominance over women. It's sort of like that Key and Peel sketch where uh, Key and Peel, they have wives and they're, they, oh, yes, yes, yes. They're like, <laughs> she was being a Bitch. Yeah, they can't say it out loud. But yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're trying to pretend. That <laughs> right. They're trying to. They're trying to signal yeah. to each other. Look, I'm in charge. Yeah, I'm in charge. I got balls. I put my woman in my place. So there's when I when I realized that it was kind of recently when I really kind of put these things together from feminists teaching me about this sort of thing. By the way, that I was like, oh my god, there's so many, there's so much energy that men put into establishing themselves as not women and not gay. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Did you, did, did you experience that? Yeah, totally. I mean, like I said, it was, uh, it was an absolute thing that you had to signal that you're male and you had to signal that you're not all those other things. And we had people in my class and in the school that showed some of those traits. And yeah, they, make, they got made fun of and it was uncomfortable. And that's another signaling. If you are a you know, fifth grade boy making fun of another fifth grade boy who is feminine by extension right. you are masculine that's right. that's right you know if you if you're worried about you know and the movie moonlight actually portrays it we'll talk, we'll talk yeah. about this a little bit later but anyway so other other toxic masculine traits bro i think the idea of boys will be boys so basically and especially when it comes to sexuality so like um you know, it, it's okay to go push the boundaries. In fact, the extreme of this is that we all grew up thinking that that the model is they will say no. You just got to push through it. Right. And yeah. That's, you would literally see that in movies. It's like, right. no, no, oh, oh. And you're like, oh, I see. Okay. So they will say no. They'll resist. That's yeah. what's expected. Right. And then we just push through it. Right. Because if you don't, you're not a real man. You know, yeah, that's right. It, and, if and, you, and even more so, that the internal message is procreation. It, it, you're not told this explicitly. You just like feel it. I will die. This is death. If I don't do this, I will die. Yeah. And my line will die. The psychological urge when the urge is raging can be, can be very strong, but it doesn't override our ability to go, oh, they don't want to do it. Unless, oh, oh, right. unless you've been taught one, you're not a real man if if you don't push past that. And two, you men take what they want. You know, real right. alpha bo alpha men, they take what they want. They don't wait. Right. And I'm not by the way. Arnold Schwarzenegger not, doesn't wait for someone to give him a bazooka and shoot it. He takes the bazooka and he shoots it. And by the way, I wasn't even talking about the the urge. I'm not talking about when you're doing the act. I'm talking about the the message we we grew up watching is the way you will get a woman is through these mechanisms right and since implicitly we learn that if we don't get a woman and have children we essentially die and everyone in our descendants dies right i am going to die if i don't dominate women right yeah so 
Uh, other toxic masculine traits, Bruno. Um, let's see. I have to. Oh, I probably the the. I have to be the one to explain. You know the, what do they call it? Mansplaining. Mansplaining. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now this one, this one I know that the way I look at it is like it happens more with men because men are in charge. Well, and men are taught to be intellectually and conversationally in charge. At the same time, I've noticed that it's also very related to personality because oh yeah, men mansplain to each other based on their personality. Well, <laughs> not to mansplain to you right now, Berto, but the way that I see it is that anyone can explain regardless of gender, and you'll see it. You know, women will explain, yeah. uh, meaning, and explain you know means to tell someone something, sort of lecture them from a top-down position about things that they probably already know and it's inappropriate and it hurts the other person's feelings and thus annoys them, you know, to walk up to some, you know, someone's pumping gas in, in the car and you just walk up to you and be like, so actually you're supposed to put the nozzle into the gas tank uh, insertion point and you're supposed to put the credit card. Right. You, you, I know you didn't know this, but you're supposed to put the credit card. Um, so anyone can do that. Uh, based on personality or circumstance or something. But men are particularly prone to it because they're taught that they're supposed to be dominant, that they know more than women do, and you know, especially in certain topics. You're not going to see a lot of mansplaining um, among things that they don't associate with men. But there's this, there's this classic, someone posted on Reddit the other day, that she was at like a science conference and she's a physicist or something. I can't remember, mathematician or something. And she was in a conversation and she was talking about her expert area and and this this guy who didn't really know what, he was, what was she was talking about or what he was talking a about book right is this the yeah, one yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> he he jumps in he's like well actually if you've read blah, the, blah, blah. the book by so and so they say da 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 and and she lets him finish and yeah. she says yeah that's me that's I, my book. That's my <laughs> that's my publication. And it it's just a classic example of mansplaining. He right. he's telling her something that she's a super expert on, acting like she doesn't know it. Right. That that's the definition of mansplaining. And once I started to understand, you know, that's what, now I will also say that men are sometimes accused of mansplaining when they're not mansplaining and that's yeah so i got accused of mansplaining one time at work and the reason is we were in a meeting and it was a virtual meeting and i someone said and this person was well they identify as female she said something and i said the classic uh i think what she's trying to say is blah right? <laughs> yeah. okay now that is a classic like they show it in movies they show it in things like not to do this yeah. right and I think afterwards, just, someone said, hey, you shouldn't do it. Now, the catch is, I'm a narcissist. I think I can explain things better than anyone else. <laughs> so I wasn't saying it because, oh, she's a woman. They won't understand her. Because actually, most of the people in the meeting were actually, um, it, it, I think it was definitely a majority of females in the meeting. So it's not like I'm like, oh, I'm explaining it to the guys because, honey. you know, It was just like, I think, probably incorrectly, that I'm going to, I'm going to explain, human explain, because gonna, I think I can make more sense out of what you just said. Well, you're right? help. You're helping. I, I think I'm helping, and whether I I was or wasn't, it, it wasn't coming in this instance. I'm not saying I've never done it, but in this instance, it wasn't coming from a side of like it's because you're a woman, right? And so that happens, and 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 like you said, all sorts of people do these kinds of things. Well, let me Some ask personalities you: personalities are more prone to it. This person that you did that for, do you do you think she was bothered by that? I don't know because it was someone else that brought it up to me. Yeah, so we would have to ask her because <laughs> yeah. if she was like, if she was like, well, he didn't really get it right, but I don't care, or if if she said, well, yeah, I mean, I was in the middle of my sentence and he just like took over the the thing and he's and right and <laughs> and he like it kind of silenced me like then that's my right. explaining and I'll, t I'll tell you what i took from it in either case i was like yeah i shouldn't do that because I, who am i to phrase things better than what you just said if people didn't understand what someone said someone will say oh i, I didn't quite get that point 
Well, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, but it's not a bad impulse to be like, I, I, I sense the room is not aligning or understanding what they're saying. I, I think I can help. I, that, I, yeah, that, that's, I, not, that's not terrible. It's not terrible, but I, I'll But you might you want to I, ask. You might want to ask, hey, would it help if I... And or you should know the person you're splaining for, right? That's fair. So I'll tell you what I've done since, because I literally thought about it. I was like, here's what I've done since. Whenever I feel like some point was made that's kind of getting lost or it didn't really work or whatever, I'm not, I don't frame it as, I think what such, such and such is trying to say, right? Mm-hmm. Instead, I just make a point from my perspective at the risk that it might be redundant but I'd rather look redundant than make someone else look bad. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And, uh, yeah, other manifestations of toxic masculinity, bro. I think certainly some really bad ones. So um, sexual harassment in the workplace. Right. And I, I know this can go both ways, but I'm saying the idea of men are in charge. If there are women coming to the workplace, uh, they should, and this is how it used to be, and it's, getting slowly better, but they should look pretty and we should be able to like say anything we want to them and probably slap their ass in. Right, and this is, I guess more broadly, is just sexual harassment of women in various contexts, yeah. like, you know, in public, but at work, you know. And again, this idea of entitlement, dominance, women don't really matter, their, their feelings don't really matter, they want it, uh, signaling to other men, you know, I, the more and more I think about it, the more and more I believe that the catcalling, the sexual harassment, particularly if it's in front of other men, is performative. What do you think about that? It There is an aspect that is performative. I believe that you're right. I also think that there is a uh, an aspect that is um, fantasy fulfillment because, mm-hmm. y- you know, you're like, oh, I get to interact with a woman in this powerful way what i will say though is uh, this is one of those areas where i feel like totally agree the problem has been uh 99 on the male side because men have been in charge but but we should be weary cautious whatever that as we move into the future we don't make the mistake of thinking that all humans don't suffer from a lot of the same hangups and things I, i bring this up because uh i was at work many many years ago and a female coworker was telling me about how every lunch she likes to go eat lunch uh, at the basketball court to watch one of our male coworkers because he plays with his shirt off and now she sits there and drools the whole time. Okay, if a male said that at the workplace these days, that would be, sorry, if anyone said that at the workplace these days. But back then, neither I nor I think anyone thought much of that comment because it wasn't just to me, there was a room full of people. And I think part of it is because, wow, well, she's a woman. She, she should be able to say that. But in, in reality, no, the, those behaviors are actually not okay in general. It's just that it happens to be that male, males have been the ones in charge and predominantly. And therefore, so as we move forward, let's definitely fix the male problem. But let's all remember, power should not oppress the powerless. Yeah. And you, I, even more micro, shouldn't do things that make other people feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, if the dude playing basketball was into it, then great. She, they, they're flirting yeah. and she likes to go, you know, look at him with a shirt off and he likes her looking then hundred percent. But if you don't, if you don't know that the target is cool with it, then you're risking putting them in a very uncomfortable place. And and that's the point. The, the other thing is that, uh, because men have been in power and because men are socialized particularly uh, to do all this kind of stuff more often, the uh, if a woman were to be playing basketball and there was a guy uh, you know, leering at her, there's a much bigger sense of, of danger there. Uh, it might not be dangerous, but the, the chances of it being dangerous are, are higher. Can a woman rape a man? Yes. So a man could absolutely be in danger if a woman were, you know, leering at him. But uh, on average, you know, and especially the way it feels given the averages, uh, gendered, uh, it's not a equal scenario gender-wise, you know but, what I'm saying? But at work, it's not only about the, the physical threat, it's the, 
the hierarchy threat. In this case, the, sure. the, the woman in question was a full-time employee, pretty high level, and the male was a temp employee, yeah. very low level. I mean, if that's, if there's a, an, an, if the temp feels the need to please the full-time person for their own employment safety, is that what you're saying? Well, that as well as like the context was a room full of people, that male employee was not in the room this person is talking sexually about that male employee and about how this person ogles them during lunch. Yeah. And at the time, we all laughed and we thought that was hilarious. Right. And that's not okay. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's happened to me where, as a, the target of that kind of thing. Women years and years ago would put hands on me and, and I wasn't comfortable with it. I, I didn't feel unsafe. I didn't because of the context that I'm in, and I guess just because of who I am and the confidence I have, I guess, in my own physical abilities, I suppose. But I do, I did remember feeling like, this is not okay. You can't, we work together and you're my boss. And, you know, you're a woman putting hands on me in ways that I, I didn't consent to. And, right. and, and so, you know, that certainly can happen. But the toxic masculine aspects of this is that men are, taught that they're supposed to do this and they have the right to do it does that mean that women don't do it no women you know people in power will do yeah. bad things all the time being a womanizer is another toxic i think it's kind of particular mm -hmm. but being able to bag the babe you know and and score with as many chicks as possible is was definitely a message i yeah, was taught yeah, growing definitely up. were you taught that Oh, yeah, that's a, that's everywhere again in media and history everywhere. Yeah, that is definitely the goal. Yeah, you're a real man. If, Absolutely. If you can. And, and again, things have definitely been changing. But I'm saying as we grew up and even into recent memory, uh, women are supposed to be virgins. Right. Yeah. To address that, things are changing for the better in a lot of ways regarding gender and some young people might be listening. It's like, well, you know, it wasn't you know, it wasn't really like that for me. And you know, God bless you, I'm happy. And that's, you know, partly, if not completely, a result of us having these conversations, one, and evaluating it, doing research, blah, 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 speaking out, picketing. Um, but the other thing I'll say is that it's, it's become more subtle in today's, uh, at least, you know, suburban, uh, mainstream American society. Right. When we were kids, it was very overt. You know, yeah. if I remember when I was a kid, there was this um, film that we would always watch called Free to Be You and Me. And it was about a lot of things uh, about racism and also about toxic masculinity to some hmm. extent. There was a whole segment on a boy who liked dolls and how everyone was making fun of him. Mm. And I remember really, I mean, five years old watching this film, I remember really taking it in of like, yeah, that is kind of stupid. Like, <laughs> why can't he like dolls? Right. But it was really against what he was supposed to do and everyone bullied him and everyone. And he's just like, I don't know, I just kind of like dolls. And and so it it was pretty bad in the past, but you know, it's still there, you know, and research shows this, that you'll ask two-year-old, three-year-old humans the differences, and you'll ask them, do boys or girls, or does it not matter, who is the one who drives the car? Who is the one who is in charge? Who is yeah. the one who cooks? Who is the one who does this? And immediately, young kids will say, oh, well, that's, that's men. Right. Boys do that. Oh, girls do that. And against all of our wishes, you know, even if you're doing everything you could possibly do, there's still so much signaling that's happening to kids around what makes a proper boy and what makes a proper girl. And you'll, we also research this, young children, two, three, four years old, about values, not just like what's associated with, with boys and girls, but also like how are you supposed to be as a boy? Yeah. And you know, they'll, a research will so show on average kids will say well to be a good boy you have to be uh, in control you have to be physically in, you know i don't know the exact way that four-year-olds would word it and if you're a girl then you listen well you know like there's these associations that are just like uh unpleasant <laughs> to be thinking that to be a boy you can't listen well and to be a 
to be a girl, you can't assert yourself. Right. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so other toxic masculine ideas, just go through my notes. Non-emotionalist is a big thing. Uh, I've talked about this before that when I was young, I knew as a boy, I wasn't supposed to cry. Getting back to yep. you, and, you and me crying earlier. <laughs> 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 that I went on a mission in the sixth grade that whenever I cried, I would convert it into anger. <laughs> And I would literally ball up my fists and like bunch up my face in anger whenever I had an urge <laughs> to cry. And I eliminated crying. I wow. didn't I didn't cry for years because I, you know, suppressed <laughs> the tears. I suppressed yeah. sadness. I got rid of quote unquote weakness in yep. me. And it took me my entire twenties to re engage in crying. Yeah. You and uh, you and I have shared how because I have very similar experience where my dad I mean, my dad would threaten, he never beat me, but he basically threatened to hit me if I cried. Really? So I never, you know, I was like, because I, and I was little, I was like, it's like, don't you cry. You know, like that was the worst thing I could do was cry. So yeah, I learned like, okay, there's one thing I should not do and that's cry. Yeah. And he's a child psychiatrist. He's a child psychiatrist. (laughs) The other idea is self-reliance. The, you know, the Clint mm. Eastwood riding off into the sunset kind of thing. Right. Yeah, that one I didn't get. <laughs> that one I did not get somehow. <laughs> yeah. I don't I don't know why I didn't get that one socialized into me. It was socialized into actually, me. Actually, no, no, I take it back. Sorry, that's not true. Uh, I actually absolutely had it fully socialized into me. It's just a different kind, meaning uh, economic self-reliance. Yeah. I should not borrow money. I should not da 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 um, what I the one that I didn't was more like I should be able to build my own car and build my own house. Yeah, um, but build your own computer. Build my own computer. You, you're, you, That's you, true. You do that on your on your That's own. That's true. Um, By the way, I don't think so. To poke a little bit, I don't think there's anything wrong with self reliance being no. taught to humans. No, um, but at what cost and when? <laughs> so. Yeah. Being self reliant and not depending on others and not bothering costs. Not bothering problem, others. Yeah. You know, like yeah. I don't know how to make my own food. I'm not self reliant. You know. Right, right. You should be able to get up and get your ass something in the fridge, you know. But when we look at the self reliant um, messages that are given given to men, there are these huge effects. Men die sooner, primarily, in my mind, because of this self-reliance. You'll have a 65-year-old man who either is divorced or, or, or his spouse has died, or he's just, for, for whatever reason, not with anyone, and they don't go to the hospital. They don't call the doctor, on average, and thus die a lot sooner. And they also will uh, kill themselves from suicide a lot sooner at any age, uh, you know, I think the rates are something like four to five times uh, more likely to die from suicide if you're a man. And the prevailing wisdom is that it's because men in the, be- you know, well before they become suicidal, they don't ask for help. You know, they just stuff their feelings. I'll tell you why. Yeah, that makes sense. Not I'll that t- women are right. taught to, to, to ask for help, right. but they're just not as taught to be shamed about it as sure. much as men are. I they're they're still that. shamed. Women are still shamed for asking for help. You know what I mean? The, the thing that I, that I find funny is, the reason I was hesitating with this one is because now I'm realizing there's an opposite thing at play where I grew up that is very much still a problem. You see, women are supposed to do all the cooking, all the clothes washing, all the house cleaning, not men. I grew up in a household with my grandma and my my great aunt. They did everything. And my dad, you know, he would force me to like help clean the dishes and I hated it. So guess what? When I tried to live by myself as an adult, I was like 30 and I had an apartment by myself. I didn't know what to do. I was not self-sufficient. But because of toxic masculinity, because I was not taught to be yeah. self-sufficient. Yeah, I think it, there's a difference between self-reliance practically and self-reliance like emotionally. Yeah. Like you're supposed to, as a man, be okay emotionally on your own. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that's the main thing. Yeah. 
The other toxic masculine idea I want to talk about is being tough. How? What messages were you given? I don't know if you got any. Oh, about, yeah, certainly. About, that was the main. Like, men, boys are tough. Yeah. Girls are weak. That was part of my dad's thing. Like, you're not crying because you're supposed to be tough. Right. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. What about at school, that kind of? At school, all media, all books, everything was, if there's one thing that we got to do is not cry and be tough. <laughs> right. And, again, there's nothing wrong with being resilient and calling upon your inner power to get through something. But there is something wrong with with always, <laughs> you know, erring on the side of quote unquote toughness instead of like sometimes saying, um, maybe, you know, for example, when we, you know, I played football my entire childhood and, and teenage years. And whenever anyone got hurt, it was especially back, it's not so much yeah. this way anymore because we have like science on our side, but Back then, apparently we didn't. It was, you know, you just walk it off. Yeah. Um, and no water. That was another thing. Like, <laughs> Which is so insane. What I does know. that have to do with anything? Because now uh. it's all about hydrate, hydrate. But when we were in the 80s, we would be doing three, pra we call them three a day, three practices a day in August. And in Seattle, you know, it could be 80, so 80s, 90s. And you're in the sun, you know, yeah. playing football on full pads. Uh, well, one practice was without pads, but, you know, still. And you'd be dying of thirst, yeah. and they would say, uh, you know, water's for pussies. So that one is, I, that I never experienced, and I don't begin to understand what the logic is there. Well, because <laughs> because of toughness. If we're going to, we're trying, you know, the coaches... We're trying to make <laughs> okay, but, we're trying to make tough football players. But understand the way I'm understanding it is okay. No breathing. Yeah, but no breathing. Right. But that back, would only last three minutes. But back then, <laughs> we did. I don't know about you, but I did not grow up in a hydration aware no, I society. Didn't. I drank very little water. Yeah, I was constantly dehydrated. Yeah, water was for pussies. Like yeah. I always wondered why my lips were always chapped. Yeah, I'm like I I, I was constantly dehydrated. Yeah, people were passing out from. But it wasn't because of that, though. Like, we never, I don't remember in Colombia, I don't remember ever there being a thing about you should not drink water. I just didn't know that I was supposed to drink water. Yeah. That was mainly it. We didn't even have our own hydration, yeah. like, bottles. You you, yeah. you had to go to the, uh, the, <laughs> the faucet fountain, or, yeah. or, a, yeah. or a hose. So, um, and, and look, a lot of these things, uh, not the water one, but the toughness, again, I think they are remnants they're like little vestigial bits of animal and human reality um that were necessary were necessary to survive in this harsh universe but well, now uh, we have other needs so i'll agree that part of it is that way but what anthropologists will point to is that in hunter-gatherer societies even today the there's a much more egalitarian um, democratic system because you don't need to stratify society. Whereas once you became agricultural and then civilization, there and ownership of land, and you can't have two people own the land. There can only be one person, you know, and, and he has to he has to pass that land to someone, you know, that all that stuff that doesn't exist for the vast majority of our evolution. Now there has to be a higher hierarchy. And you can make an argument that because but, but because the hierarchy I agree with, but the toughness is the part um because like again, just watching these these people that are still living the way that people used to live, and there's a kid walks right into a honey tree to get honey, gets stung by the bees, doesn't care. They go and they're like running all day and throwing arrows and slicing up baboons sure. and they don't care. And you had to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And at for, I don't know, this is just me hypothesizing, tribal harmony, you can't have everyone complaining all the time. Exactly. Like, you, you've got to put your own little inconveniences aside for the greater good of the tribe. You know, we got to, there's a job that has to be done. No one wants to go do this thing, but we all have to do our part. And so there's this notion of toughness, toughness versus yeah. versus yeah. being too narcissistically centered on your own pain. But when you stratify society in a in a civilization, 
and you need to differentiate between men and, you know, uh, it might be, this is surprising to a lot of people, but sexism and gender differences are much greater in civilized society, you know, quote unquote, mainstream industrialized societies than they are in hunter gatherer societies. And because it seems like, well, if we're going back in time, so to speak, it seems like there would be more gender because that's more Neanderthal. But that's it's the opposite. We, we we developed patriarchy and a lot of the toxic masculine ideas. Uh, you know, maybe the germ, the the seed was in survivability fifty thousand years ago, but it it morphed into what we see today because of the need for control of populations. You know, and the need for stratification of society in order for because in order for a, a a million people to get together you know to to work together you can't rely on the normal signaling of like demo, democracy and gender equality there has to be this stratification so that everyone knows where they are in the hierarchy uh, absolutely and unfortunately it, when you have a situation where if you rewind the clock it's like i'm going to challenge people to be in charge if people disagree, how did it used to get solved? Well, you fight. So like whoever was the toughest, I guess, gets to be in charge. Whoever killed the most people gets to be in charge, period. And most often, that was a man. <laughs> well, when they, it's hard to know what it was like 50,000 years ago, but when they look at tribal, you know, hunter-gatherer societies today, you know, groups of 50 people, uh, and not every hunter-gatherer society is the same, but they, from the experts I've heard, the the tendency is not towards like a physically dominant leader. That there's much more of a working together. Kind That's in the hunter gatherers, right? Yeah, but when they started farming, and you got to decide who's going to be in charge. Right, right. I, I didn't, yeah, it's I didn't. like whoever's the killer. Yeah, but I I just find that it, I I thought you were saying something different, yeah. but but I find it interesting myself that because I I was told the story, you know, of of, of what we were really like, you know, like civilization helped bring order to chaos. That was always yeah. the idea. But in some ways you could say civilization and agriculture brought chaos to order. Yeah. It depends how you slice it. Of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, but, but or that, that in the past we were less civilized, less kind, less aware or less cooperative, yeah. you know, like, but that's actually, it's the opposite. And the reason you barely hear of, you know, there's Alexander the Great, there's Genghis Khan, there's all these guys, 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 guys. There's no TV, there's barely any books. It's because, you know, whoever was the killer gets in charge. And then when you build a big hierarchy, sure, maybe the guy at the top can't technically physically defeat all the people down below. But at some point, as they were rising up the, the ranks, they were pretty physically capable. And if someone did challenge them, they probably could kill them or at least... They would believe that they could. And after a while, now we're here in modern times and it's not useful. Yeah. We don't, we're not fighting each other on horses. <laughs> let's take a break and we get back. Let's talk about positive masculine traits. What do you say, Berto? Let's do it. So, Berto, if a toxic masculine man were to convince the listeners right now who weren't patrons to become patrons, what would you sound like? Hey, listen, all you big old pussies, you gotta do me one favor and get off your little pink high horse and go to psychologyinseattle.com and become a patron. That's patron with a P like penis because you gotta do it right like a man. Uh, do it or else I'm gonna come and kick your ass. <laughs> <laughs> all right, positive traits, Birdo. Uh, my definition of a positive masculine trait are masculine traits that make a positive difference. Just a, you know, a, and you could extend that to, uh, you know, un, un, uh, unsupportive of the patriarchy, you could say. And the other thing I'll say is that this is a pretty complicated area because one, any one of the harms that I have in my notes here as positive masculine traits could be used to harm others. As same with many of the toxic ones could possibly not be toxic at times so i would just want to say that for the beginning i was just like 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 the first one that i wrote in my notes was protective you know that that's a masculine trait and that could be a positive thing 
uh, like rushing into a burning building to save a child, you know, that kind of protective masculine thing. Or it could be a toxic thing where you feel like you have to control women as if they're sheep, you know what I mean? The way a shepherd right. protects their flock, you know, right, I'm going right. to protect my women. So any one of these traits can can be used to harm. Uh, the other thing is that it's complicated is that none of these traits are inherently man. <laughs> you know, any yeah. one of these things could be possessed and held true to them, you know, self by anybody, regardless of gender. So it gets weird when you talk about positive masculine traits, because are you saying that women can't be this way? And it's like, no, absolutely not. Um, the I, other wonder, th- I wonder if, because the way I was thinking about it was, um, as long as you're going to be, quote unquote, manly, can we apply your right. manliness for good purposes? Exactly. And that, that, that's my point, is that, we're, you know, we're going, we, are, we have, including me, by the way, people who identify not only as men, but also as being masculine. I like... I guess being masculine or I, I right. can't get away from the fact that I have impulses of masculinity. So if that is going to happen, then, and I, I have expectations that are on me from other people, you know, like if I am with my family, I have um, expectations on me because I'm a man, you know, yeah. Uh, my wife expects me to do certain things because I'm a man. So it comes from within, it comes from without. And if this is the system that some of us are living within, which is totally dependent on a lot of things, then we might as well identify those positive ones and try to accentuate them and and evaluate them. The other thing I'll say is that it's completely dependent on your cultural pocket. You know, like in our cultural pocket, Birdo, being physically dominant over other men isn't exactly a huge masculine right. ideal. In fact, we might see those people as dullards and yeah. not smart. Whereas being intelligent and being quick-witted is extremely valued yeah. valued by our cultural circle. And you could argue the masculine side of that you and I ascribe to, right. you know, to be entertaining, to be assertive, to be funny, to be smart, yeah, to yeah. debate well, you know, like, I, again, that's not a, that's not inherent to men or women can't be that way, but it is a way in which I think at least I express my masculinity through. Do you do that? Uh, yes. And, and I would say that if you ask me what my top positive masculinity traits are, and then you ask me what my top feminine traits are, they might be identical, or at least 99%. <laughs> yeah. So, protective is one, being helpful, you know, being potentially sacrificial within reason. What's another positive masculine trait, bro? So, for me, fairness, being fair, uh, is, is an important one. I think I, I learned that one from my dad. And again, if you ask me, is that a positive trait for women and anyone who identifies in it? Yeah, absolutely. It's just that I'm saying, as men, well, do we you, should be yeah fair do you, well do you know what i mean when i say expressing my masculinity through certain behaviors and values i think i do because that's sort of what i'm talking about i'm saying like uh, i'll give you this example i i was at a Scott high school dance not recently when i was in high school <laughs> i want to clarify i was at a high school dance and i heard that someone outside was jumping on cars I walked outside to go confront the person. And I didn't do it out of, gorilla, I'm threatened by the gorilla. I mean, I did it out of a sense of fairness. That, I felt, was unfair to everyone. Right. Right. But, and is there, so let's drill down on this a little bit. Because there's other elements of, you know, there's fairness. But there's also, like, I have the right to go out there. And I'm not worried about a confrontation. Right. I take control. Um, I do what's right. You know, I stand right. for principles. You know, there's a lot of things in there other than just fairness. Oh yeah, right. But I'm I'm thinking like this is an example of the motivation 
absolutely 100% for me was not, oh, territorial dispute, I love it. I go, it was, oh, that's not fair. I'm going to see if there's anything I can do about it. Now, what's funny is, unbeknownst to me, our female basketball coach, who was this awesome dude, um, everyone looked up to him. He was standing at the door and saw me do this, but I didn't know this. Wait, you said female basketball coach. He was the coach for the female basketball team. Oh. (laughs) He was himself not a female. Okay. Um, But he saw me do this. I went up to this person who actually, I think, was a senior. I was a junior, and they were bigger than me. Um, And we didn't get in a fight, but I confronted him. He came down from the car. Why was he on the car? Uh, Who knows? Crazy teenagers. And I said, so this is in Tacoma? In Tacoma. And I said, you can't do this. Like, I was like, you can't do this. This is blah, 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 right? Uh, and I knew that if, if, it, if it did become physical, there's a high likelihood I would get hurt. So again, I wasn't doing it because like, I'm going to prove that I'm superior. Yeah. I was doing it in a sense of fairness. The, I heard later, many, a couple of years later, actually, I heard that um, that guy had told someone how proud they were of me. Mm. You know, and actually, it turns out he would have had my back because the teacher would have come out and be like, whatever. But I didn't know that. And so I look at that and I'm like, I learned that from my dad. Mm-hmm. And I didn't learn it from that perspective of we are men. We go with our swords and we kill everyone. It was more of like things should be fair. Right. So let me ask you, and maybe you don't have an answer, but did you associate that value? And again, there's there's a lot more there other than fairness. There's confrontation fearlessness yeah you know principled behavior yeah did you associate that with masculinity i feel like i did yes okay and did you feel and you know i've and i've never really thought about it this way that it's almost like putting on a costume but liking it well it's because the people i admire as men would have done that Right. So, so I think that's what's so interesting about this exploration for me uh, doing this episode and, and thinking about it is like, you know, because I was thinking, okay, why, why do I feel like I need to identify positive masculine? Tra- why can't I just identify positive human traits? Right. But it's because I want to be masculine. <laughs> yeah. But what is masculinity other than just a costume that, you know, a play? And, and I know gender uh, experts and academics have been using similar terms for decades. You know, there's a, we, we play gender that, that I'll hear that uh, being talked about. And, um, or we play, um, you know, the gender expression anyway. And, I think five, 10 years ago, I would have been like, no, I don't, I don't want to do that. I've often, I think because of toxic masculinity, rejected masculinity from an early age. You know, I, I would say like, I'm above that. that yeah. I, I don't, I don't ascribe in the same way. I don't ascribe to a lot of American negative ideas. And, as, but so a similar idea actually of, I don't ascribe to a lot of toxic American ideas, but there are positive American ideas right. that we forget about sometimes. And I think it's a similar discourse. You know, there's an attack from liberals on American ideals or American toxicity. But what about the positive side? You know, like right. when we went to Europe in World War II, we didn't have to go there. Now you could argue, well, it was just for oil, da, da, da. Okay, but the individuals who went over there were fighting for freedom. They were fighting, they weren't fighting to invade England or France. They were fighting for French people. They were fighting for Polish people. They were fighting eventually for Jewish people. And right. and, and that's just one example, you know, but in the similar way for, for masculinity, I think I've, I don't know how I feel about it, but sort of the end result or at this phase of my understanding is I want to play the masculine game. I want to put on the masculine costume. That's a desire of mine. And I better, I have to be intentional about what, what those things are instead of just acting like I'm not doing that or want to do it. <laughs> well, the socialization cuts both ways because you and I both grew up with what we would call positive male role models as well, for example. But yet, they're still genderizing things. 
Because, and that's kind of why I was saying sometimes we have to decouple parts of this because Indiana Jones, right? To me, that was a positive role model, right? He is a smart, educated man. He is not just a guy with a gun shooting people, right? He has a gun, he has a whip, but he's first of all, an archeologist, a brainy nerd, right? He happens to be good looking, but that's aside. And he happens he, to be white going into brown fine, pe- people. Fine, fine, right, fine. So do you see what I'm saying? Like there are aspects of imperialism and a sexism and things. But at the same time, the guy isn't, when he goes and fights these people, he's not the buffest, he's not the best. He tries really hard and he's okay getting hurt as long as it's for the right cause, right? Like this kind of thing. And he can admit when he's afraid. And he's, a, exactly. Snakes. So he had Why did it have to a be lot snakes? of positive masculinity traits but it's still socialization it's still teaching me that there are some things that are more male than others right okay now i'd say i would take that i'll take that because i'd rather have those traits than the bad the really bad traits because he like the worst thing he did related to women was that he had left marion unexpectedly or suddenly when she was young and and they had sex or they were romantically involved right but he we don't see him hitting her or uh, demeaning her because she's a woman or something. Now, there are inherent sexualized things in that movie or sex, sex sexist things in that yeah. movie because of the time. Okay, so that's an example. Another example would be like um, when I think of James Bond. We've talked about James Bond. James Bond is one of the like most sexist, you know, in the early movies especially, like hits women, all these things, like terrible, right? Now, as the movies progress or maybe if you put that, awful thing aside for a second there are some positive things right again the guy uses smarts and um he is like on the side of fairness and he's on the side of, of right and he does yeah etc 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 and whereas a lot of the people that he goes up against are very toxic they're you know they're doing all these things they're abusing people they're you know all these things. right and so i want to delineate that because as i was you know thinking about this and looking particularly on the internet we I want to delineate, for obvious reasons, toxic behavior and toxic masculine behavior. Right. Because we can look at, like, I was looking at TV characters that people think are toxic masculine, and they were pointing at, like, um, Ramsey Bolton or, or Jeff, right. Joffrey, Jeffrey Baratheon or something. And it's like, yeah, those characters on Game of Thrones did terrible things, but it was it clear that they were ascribing to a toxic masculine ideal, and that's that was influencing why they were doing those things. Um, you know, you can have terrible people that are doing terrible things, but they're not at least noticeably motivated by uh, trying to be masculine. Which is ironic because one of the people I list that you asked me to make a list was uh, Tywin Lannister. Okay. Because to me, he kind of epitomizes the, I'm the man. Right. I'm going to be in charge. All right. Well, that's interesting. We'll get into that because I have a lot of opinions about Tywin Lannister. Now, I haven't read the book, right? So I'm just going by the, the yeah. show. It's, it's similar. It, yeah. It's very similar. Um, but anyway, my point is, is that when we're talking about toxic masculinity, we're not just talking about anything that a man does that's bad. We're talking about when men, and it's hard, of course, to know, yeah. are playing the role of a, of a man, what parts of those behaviors are 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 harmful to others anyway so other it's funny how we can't stick in the positive zone we always got to go to the negative brito another positive masculine trait so another one that's going to be itchy and scratchy honesty yeah i i again i think this idea like and recently in the last few years honesty has gone out the window Right. But I think that honesty is a mask. And I'm not, again, not saying it's only for males. Absolutely not. I'm just saying when I think of males that I admire, they're honest people. Yeah. What's an example of this? So, Mr. Rogers or a, uh, like, you know, take uh, in the, in the movies, uh, like, it's a wonderful life, right? Like, he's honest. These people are honest actors, they are truthful. Um, now I'm not saying they never, they never like ever told a lie or something. It's more about like their whole demeanor is oriented towards honesty and openness. Honesty in the face of disapproval. Absolutely. Yeah. They don't care if they will be like ostracized, if they will go bankrupt, if they, whatever. They're going to say what's real. Like in the, it's a wonderful life. He goes up to Mr. Potter and he's offered the world and he's like, he's got to be honest and true to himself and to Mr. Potter and to everyone saying, no, 
I can't. And that is nearly his ruin. For you, if you were to and when you exhibit that, do you connect that? Because for me, it's like, am I just being a human right now? Am I being an American right now? Uh, or am I, or at least in part, am I, am I identifying right now with a man as I do this thing? You know what I'm saying? That's another one of the ones that I got from my dad. So I do identify it as a positive male thing. But and so when you are honest, yeah, and you're being that that style of honest, do you feel like in retrospect you're being masculine? Like you're 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 express. That's a way you're you're. Uh, in a satisfact self satisfaction way, that you're you're meeting your own need to express your masculinity through that honesty. Yeah. Okay. Because you know what I mean. It's it's kind yeah. of a weird distinction because. Well, it is related to the whole machismo thing. That's what I'm saying. It's all indoctrination, no matter how you slice it. But I am being macho by being honest. Okay. That that's a good way to put it. It's like if you can if that feels congruent. I am being macho. By being that I am being manly yeah. by doing X, Y, and Z, then I think you're in a zone of expressing masculinity. And then you want to ask yourself, is it toxic or positive? Exactly. And that's where I land is look, let's say I can't escape, I can't fully escape the fact that I am part of society and I have genes, right? I can't escape these things. But then if I were to choose or if I could choose, would I rather have traits that include honesty, integrity, blah, 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 yeah, like all these things? Or would I rather be, you know, abusive and harassing and la, da, 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 right? Yeah. And so, grant, granted, I am indoctrinated no matter what, but I would much rather have these traits. Right. What's another positive trait? Uh, okay. So, I will say strength. Um, physical strength? Physical and part of the toughness, but... How do I say this? Because we just said it was a, a potential negative, right? Can be, yeah. It can be. But I do. I have always thought of like, you know what? This is a tough problem. I'm going to get through this. You know, I did this last year as I've been struggling with health issues. I did it um, in when I had trouble like passing let's, tests or well, things. Let's, you know, let's just drill like, down on the health issues. What positive and toxic masculine... Uh, you know, influences were on that process. We've you know, talked ask, about asking some, asking for help. Yeah, we talked about some of this. Where like I realized uh, I caught myself being in the hospital at one point, and like, oh wow, I haven't told anyone I'm here, and I'm not asking for any support emotionally. You know, and that's definitely not a good right. Thing. So, just so people know, Berto had his thyroid or most of his thyroid removed because he has some disease called Graves disease. Yeah, Graves that. Um, was misdiagnosed as all sorts of things for a long time, and he was he was suffering a, a lot from fluctuating hormones. You know, yeah. you know. Anyway, all sorts of problems, and you, you were in the hospital prior to knowing you had Graves' prior disease. To that, yeah. And you talked about it on. The, we did a. It's so weird. We did an episode on health anxiety in March of yeah. of, of twenty twenty. Yeah. <laughs> As the As, pandemic, yes. and we talked a bit about COVID, but yeah. I cut it out because by the time the episode came out, our discussion was so out of date, <laughs> even though it was just a couple of weeks earlier. But anyway, and you had gone to the hospital and, and I had gone to the hospital with a um, allergic reaction. Yeah. And we vowed at some point, I think before I went to the hospital. Because ni neither of us told each other when we were in the hospital or that we had until after the fact. Right. It's like, oh, but, and by the way, I was in the ER. <laughs> yeah. And we're close enough to each other and see yeah. each other enough that I, I remember saying to you, I think I was the one who initiated it that said, look, dude, like, let's make a pact. Yeah. Like you will text me yeah. or call me that just let me know you're in the hospital, yeah. you know? Um, and when you're in the hospital, you want support, you know, and you're just sitting there in a bed. Well, sometime. no, no, but that's just it. I didn't want support. I didn't think of wanting support because of the bad parts of this. Right. Because and it's weak. I was, it was, yeah, I was embarrassed to be in the hospital. I didn't want anyone to know, and I certainly didn't want support. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, but at the very least, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. But so, and, and by the way, because it wasn't like, well, you gotta call me. It's not like I called some other friend. Yeah. I didn't tell anyone. Yeah. And so I'm sitting there 
feeling so lonely yeah. and not doing anything about it. Right. Now, can women feel the same way? Of course. 100%. We, we, we give everyone, at least in our society, a lot of shame about relying on others, for sure. But men are just giving it, you know, 50% more, let's say. You know? but, but then on the positive side, I, again, being fully aware that this is still indoctrination, blah, blah, blah. But on the positive side, I felt like I was able to rely on a part that I admire about myself and about my dad and about some role models that are male that is, okay. I'm going to do this. Winston Churchill, this thing. Yeah. You know, going to get through this. And it sucks because, yeah, you're right. Like, can't wait. Women can't get, like, of course. You know, like, that's not the point. But if you ask me, what are some of the, that's one of them. Yeah. And, and it again, it's a difference from, I'm strong because I can go and beat every other man up, right? It's, I'm strong because I can get through really difficult situations. Yeah. Or, or I'm going to give it my best, right? <laughs> right. Superman doesn't just say, wow, this is tough. I give up. Right. Yeah. You know, what's another positive trait? Um, I'd say, okay, so now we're getting a little bit more into the sex, the gender part. I'd say uh, kindness to women. Let, let me put it that way. Kindness to women. And that one is one that I didn't uh, get a complete picture growing up on. So again, uh, growing up in Colombia is weird because it is a very sexist society. And my dad in particular was, is, was fairly sexist. Um, but... I also grew up with two grandmas in the house and another grandma nearby and lo actually lots of female influences, aunts, cousins, female cousins. So I got two sides of this coin and I feel like I got good and bad. So for me, I did learn some amount of kindness, you know, like kindness to females. As a masculine trait. As a masculine trait. Yeah. Because I was, I was the male cousin to my male, to my female cousin who was a little younger than me, and I could be a good role model, mm. right? And protector, protector, and also just even no, but not not even the protector part. Actually, the friendly part, the mm. I'm nice to you part. Mm. I listen. We ha we share actual real life together, and that to me is is an important thing. So if you're gonna be a boyfriend, a husband, and you want to be a strong male and be indoctrinated in a positive way it's like be friendly mm -hmm. be nice what's another positive trait um okay i'd say it's kind of along these lines be curious about pleasuring <laughs> your your mate <laughs> and so as opposed to like well i'm gonna get off because i'm the male and i got it so that's the negative one mm -hmm. the positive would be like i'm gonna make sure you have a fun time yeah, that is a an aspect of masculinity that you'll see of like that guy, you know, or women will talk about a man like, ooh, he knows he knows his way around a woman's body. And this one's a little conflicted for me because honestly, part of it I think stems from uh, some of the abuse I I suffered as a child, hmm. in that you know I was sort of like the the, the TLDR was at, at five I was uh, uh, so everyone warning but. At five, I was um, sexually abused by a 12-year-old female babysitter. So part of what I learned was, oh, I'm supposed to pleasure, and I'm not supposed to get pleasure, right? So that those are the negative aspects. Uh, the, the flip side is, as I've matured, had therapy, all these things, right? I actually really do care in a more positive way nowadays about, I'm here for you, but I will also have fun. It's just that I'm here for you. And I think that that's a positive thing. Mm -hmm. Just a, a tricky one, personally. <laughs> What's another positive trait? I think, okay, so how about this one? This one's relevant. Uh, conservatorship, or uh, how do you call it? Uh, curating, uh, caring for. So we have a planet, we have a society, we have a city, we have a house. I think a positive male trait that I didn't learn, this is one that I sorely lack, is care like that uh, caring for and being clean and 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 really like making making the environment good, mm. uh, and I say that because I lived in a house that was in disrepair. My dad unfortunately didn't have a repairman's bone in his body. I, did, I I grew up not knowing how to fix anything, 
And if something was broken, it would just stay broken and get worse, right? And then I look at our planet and that's what that's what's happening. So what if, imagine if we use this indoctrination, but used it to say, you know what, as strong males and females, but in this case, we're males, as strong males, we're gonna lead by example. We're gonna take good care of these places. Yeah, I will sometimes dip into this and I get mixed reactions. Like, I th- again, it'd be nice if we just said, look, as good humans, you should take care of the planet. Yeah. But since a lot of people, including us, are at least in part motivated by trying to be a good blank, uh, then you might as well tap into that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, what's wrong with it, really, as long as you're being positive? Because I'll do this with Americans. Also, you know, I liberals will sometimes just try to distance themselves from America or American pride altogether, which I get. But on the other hand, a a lot of people, especially people on the right, identify strongly as Americans. So if we allow the right to define what Americans are or Mm -hmm. what American culture is, then they are driving the bus. But if we liberals participate in the American narrative, which we used to, because I remember in the 70s and 80s, like, especially in the 70s, a big part of what America meant was acceptance and listening mm. and helping and not being the bad guy, mm-hmm. you know? Now, we were just in Vietnam, but I think it was, you know, in response to that, you know, you had a bunch of <laughs> baby boomer hippies emerging into power in the 70s and 80s. Um, some of it went well, some of it didn't, but, but there were all, I just, I just remember going up with a lot of Americanism, uh, being, I I remember being very proud to be an American, you know, at 4th of July, I had a, a flag and I, and I remember believing in freedom, you know, not, not the, not the conservative version of freedom, but like freedom for everyone, freedom for people in Russia to be religious or not, freedom for you to be Jewish, freedom for you to be a feminist, you know, like freedom, that, that's what freedom meant to me. I think you just triggered a realization and and I think you, you've already arrived there, but I think I'm just arriving, is that there is an analogy here, there's a parallel between jingoism and masculinity or femininity or whatever you want, in that these things cut multiple ways and you can use them for good or bad. Right, and and to just throw the whole thing out. My, yeah, exactly. It, it's first of all, not doable because we are not, you can't just unprogram all of us overnight or something like that, right? No, and, and but so, if you don't participate in the programming, then. Right, so if you said, look, all of a sudden, none of us is gonna have any national pride of any sort and about nothing. Right? Which would kind of make sense. Right, but it's, how do you do it? But that's not gonna happen. But imagine if we did have national pride about positive things. Right. Instead of like, we have the biggest nukes but and I the d- biggest but, guns. But, but that's what I'm saying, I do. I don't know if right. that just makes me an old person or something, but to me, right. to be an American means respecting boundaries right. and participating. We invented the UN. Yeah. Americans right. hosted the United right. Right. Nations. It was our right. idea, I think. Those are the values, yeah. right? I don't know if it was an American idea, but it was a new it's still there and it was an idea of like we are going to work together. Yeah. Uh, environmentalism right. was you could argue was uh, a large part in you know sort of developed in the early part of the 20th century. Well, it's like, okay, even whether we in, in the United not, States, like, you know, Americans yeah. believe in this stuff. Scientific to, inquiry, such an American Scientific value, right? vaccines working to, we as Americans in World War II, <laughs> which is maybe the last time we ever did anything good, I don't know. We work together and we all sacrificed, you yeah. know, people, uh, recycled their tin for the right. for the government. They worked. The women worked in the factories. The men went overseas. Right. You know, everyone did their part together. You know, and and right. we didn't think of our own. You know, it didn't matter what political side you were on. We were Americans first. Yeah. We were doing a job for the betterment of humanity first, and anything else was secondary to that. And that is American to me. Yep. I've kind of dipped into that on the podcast every now and then, but anyway. Yeah. So if, if you wanna be a man out there and you wanna live 
a man, you don't have to, of, of any gender. You want to be masculine if that's your gig, if the, that's the costume you wear, the mask you wear, if you will, then lean into it and define for yourself what masculinity means, you know, because it inspires, you know. I, I don't know about you, Berto, but when I think about positive masculinity and I really kind of step into that space, it inspires me to do good. Absolutely. A, a, another example for me is I used to feel that expert expertism being an expert was one of those masculine things that that i looked at and i now i think of it in a more subtle way because i think that is actually leans into a negative one because there's this first of all experts are a problem in almost every case you look at it it's like whenever someone's an expert right and let alone that men are usually the experts right but there's a different one and one that i struggle with which is discipline so i would rather say that I want that discipline. Because the discipline is what gets you to get better and better and better and, and kind of keep going with something, right? So it, I don't have to be labeled an expert. I just want to be disciplined. Yeah. So like there's examples of that where all these aspects, if you, if you look at them, you can find a positive way to frame something. And it becomes really hard for someone to say, hey, you've been you've been, the, your actions have been leading people astray because they're honest, they have integrity, they're disciplined, they care for the planet, they care for each other. That's a hard case to make. You yeah, know? <laughs> totally. Anyone, regardless of gender, men included, should be allowed to express their uh, identity as long as it doesn't harm others and especially if it enhances the world. Right. Uh, other positive masculine traits that I came up with are being knowledgeable, for example, being knowledgeable about toxic masculinity. Again, not that women can't be knowledgeable or feminine, a feminine trait can't be, it can involve, you know, being knowledgeable. But when I think of myself, masculinity is expressed through, you know, like around the house. Yep. Uh, there will, I, I'm the one who knows everything about the fuse box and about the electricity in this house. And right. Stacy doesn't know anything about it. And I'm guessing, she, I'm pretty sure she wants me to know everything about it because then she doesn't have to know anything about right. it. And and I like knowing things about it. And it, it feels masculine. And I'm guessing that for Stacy, it feels good to have a man who knows about that sort of thing, you know? Right. And that's a masculine thing. You know, I, there's all sorts of things that I... I now, could Stacy have learned in the same way that I learned? Yeah. Yeah. But when I was... I don't know, 20 years old or something, I, I leaned into all sorts of technical house things right. to, to learn, you know? And, and so that's an expression of my masculinity. And, I, and as long as I'm not telling Stacy she can't know things and two mansplaining all over the place, then I'm, a, I'm useful, you know? Exactly. Stacy looks to me and is like, he's useful as a, as a as my husband as a man is useful right you know again I, I it sounds like i'm apologizing and in a way i am but Im, i'm imagining this like someone's like reading charging you and reading you your crimes because you were being sexualized you were being a male right it's like kirk you've been too male because you've been you know fixing things around the house and you've been polite and you've been and then you list a whole bunch of things that are useful and helpful right, right? Instead of like, oh yeah, you told your woman that she couldn't touch this and you right. told it. Like, if the things that you net out with are positive, yeah, then it's it's okay. <laughs> and it's particular, right? Because <laughs> if Stacy were different and she right. didn't want me to dominate in right. that area and I forced it, then that would be toxic. Right. E even though I'm doing the same exact thing, you know, it's completely context dependent. Well, it's funny. Even if, it's like if you and I live together, right? We have our own version of this as two males because likely I might take over a lot more of the computer duties, yeah, and you might take over more of the fuse box duties, <laughs> yeah. But we're I, still I take over being, everything except for the computer duties. We, we From my be, understanding is you know nothing about about <laughs> about anything in the home. But see, I'm as through this discussion, I'm realizing that to embrace my positive masculine traits, sure, I should have more of a inquisitive mind about my environment yeah you take care of the dudes jumping on our car in the front yard exactly I, <laughs> i'm the <a> muscle <laughs> it's funny to think about what sort of chores would divvy you probably end up being the cook can you cook at all 
I can cook. I just don't know if you want to eat what I cook. Oh. <laughs> I love what I cook. Yeah. But I love it. Okay. So I think you'd end up being the cook. Because I'm like very far from even developing initial skills of cooking. Chores that I can do. Yeah. I, mean, I, I like cleaning the bathroom. Uh, oh, okay. You can have that one. I I am screwed because, again, I didn't lift a muscle growing up. Except Neither did I. Doing dishes. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and neither did I. You okay. had to develop it. <laughs> so, so one, my parents spoiled me in all sorts of ways, and okay, were very so you did, you did have that. Two, idea. I had two older siblings oh. who did so many chores, Got and, it. and 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 I, the only thing I had to do was take out the garbage, which was kind of like once a day, and it was literally like. 20 yards of walking you know <laughs> it was from the bathroom just getting you know or from the kitchen right, right, right. walking out to the to the uh garage did and you say you had to do that in like pitch dark <laughs> yeah <laughs> well uh i had to bring the cans to the top of the road which was pitch dark like there in you know where we grew up there were right. no street lights and with there if the moon wasn't out like and and it's so stupid. Like, why didn't I bring a flashlight? And wasn't there? Did you tell me a story one time? You heard something and you had to run back. Oh yeah, that would happen regularly. Okay. Yeah, I'd be walking back, <laughs> and I, I I couldn't see anything. I'd be walking by feel of the ground because like our our <laughs> our uh, driveway was fully tree, you know, trees sure. and bushes. So even if there was light coming well, in, it were wasn't. Were you taking that as a male challenge? <laughs> you know, I just think back then. I, we just didn't think about how to use tools. Like, I don't remember having um, umbrellas. And you didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> right, you didn't have cell phone. Um, I don't know why I didn't bring a flashlight. Right. It would have been so much easier. But I think in my family, maybe, it was just like, it, it just didn't occur to people mm. to, like, have a system. You yeah. know, like, now I'm all about <laughs> systems. Like, right. I've got these super bright flashlights for, you know, this upcoming winter when we walk the dogs and anyway, other knowledge, other uh, positive masculine traits being useful, helpful, kind of went over that, uh, being courageous, like in my house, I get the spiders. I, th I think you might get the spiders. Yeah, actually, so, so let, let's talk about that one. I was traumatized when I was five. <laughs> I was traumatized a lot at five. Um, I woke up. I was having this dream where in my dream I was trapped in a web. I was trapped by a gigantic spider. And I was really scared in my dream. Had you watched Lord of the Rings? No, not back then. Well, maybe. I know it's probably more like the Godzilla movies on Sundays or something. Anyways, trapped in this giant spider web. And I woke up like sweating. And I was on my pillow. And right next to my head, there was a spider. <laughs> now, I'm sure this spider was no tarantula. But as a five-year-old waking up from such a dream and seeing a spider, I freaked out. And my dad thought it was like someone trying to break in. It was like a whole mess. But that left me kind of like scared of spiders. Uh, years go by into my adulthood. And me and Mitch, you know, we used to be roommates, you know, Mitch. We'd be sitting there. Well, short, short asterisk. Beyond that spider, did, were there a lot of spiders in your house? No. Yeah. Because you lived in the city. Yeah. Yeah. So then me and Mitch were sitting there and then like one of those big like Washington spiders would go by and we'd like, oh, and, and Washington spiders aren't even that big. You know what I mean? Well, they can get like those, those, uh, compared to uh, what I've seen or whatever. They're not tarantulas, but, but, but also like, anyway, around yeah. the world, I see much bigger spiders. Yeah. Know? But, but still, and they're, they're, Bogota, we, we I can have see any spiders. Like right. This. Right. And so I see this and we're both like, oh, we can't do it. And for years I was scared of spiders. One day I'm at a party. So talk about positive male uh, uh, attributes here. I'm at a party and I'm talking to a girl. And as we're talking- Were you she, flirting? I was flirting. And as we're talking, she goes, oh, a spider. And, <laughs> and I look over and there's a spider. <laughs> and something clicked in my primate brain. Masculinity. I grabbed a glass and I said, oh, no worries. And without fear, I put it over the spider, grabbed yeah. paper, put it there, took it outside. And from there on, I was cured. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's absolutely masculine. Because say you were there with a woman that you weren't flirting with or yeah. a woman that you were... My grandma. I would yeah. be like, spider! Yeah, but like your masculinity yeah, kicked I, in. Oh, don't worry, I, I got this. Yeah, yeah. So for me, spiders, <laughs> side note, I grew up in the woods in Sammamish, Washington, which is near Seattle, and spiders and bugs were everywhere. Yeah. Um, I walked to school through a trail in the woods. Yeah slugs were everywhere mosquitoes were everywhere um 
I would wake up in bed and, and I live, my bedroom was in the basement right. and I would wake up with, I, I one time woke up with a centipede walking across my, <laughs> my chest. Oh my gosh. And I just grabbed the centipede and, th- and yeah. threw it. Like it, it, it was bothersome, but it wasn't like, right. you know, so to me, bugs, this was a thing. bugs. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I don't really, <laughs> I don't care. Yeah. Similarly, uh, my, my brother, he was visiting when he was a kid, he was visiting a different part of Columbia. And one of the cousins there who grew up in this like very jungly area, um, they're walking, they see a, a snake. And my brother's freaking out. And the cousin just calmly, without saying anything, grabs his machete and slight grabs the snake with a machete and like kills it essentially. And and he was younger than my brother. <laughs> and so it's like one of those, like if you yeah. grow up with it. Right. Um, but yeah, so other courageous things that anyone of any gender can do, but if you're expressing your masculinity and it inspires you is, you know, like going to a protest, you know, uh, pushing back on certain things in society that could, you know, hurt you on, you know, that are for good. Um, crying in public is another courageous thing to do. Um, another positive male thing is male bonding. Like, Four dudes playing StarCraft together every Yay. day. Yay. That's right. <laughs> Just to inform the, the, the listeners out there, Berto and I, for uh, two or three weeks now, yeah. have been playing with, <laughs> with Berto's brother and this other guy, uh, an old friend of yours yeah. from work, right? Uh, the four of us have been playing StarCraft II against the computer co-op. Yep. <laughs> sometimes twice a day. Yep. <laughs> like... <laughs> out of nowhere all of a sudden we've been playing starcraft 2 yeah. like all the time it's because i had well first of all you and i talked about doing this years ago oh we did and we never did it oh. but we talked about it and then my brother because i I've, I've had three bouts of starcraft 2 when it first came out then some time went by then again and then now yeah i think me too my brother and i have been playing for a while like i even bought him a computer so we could play age of empires and starcraft 2 wait recently no that i bought him a computer two years ago <laughs> so like w- this is not even new for us and the, wait but, you you bought him a computer because his computer isn't isn't he fast. had only a laptop i couldn't do it and stuff uh. so for christmas i bought him a, a small it was a small computer but it was like just enough so we could play oh, okay and recently we had stepped it up and yeah we were doing lots of starcraft 2 and then you and i were talking and i'm like oh we should play and then, yeah, it's been great because you could do four on four against the AI. And, yeah. Yeah. So that's male bonding, you know. Um, funny. So, Berto, I, I don't know the answer to this question. The other day, your friend had his sister, uh, jo- uh, jo- sister right? yeah, yeah. join us on the, because uh, we, we chat. The Discord, on, yeah. We chat, you know, we have a voice line where we're talking as we're playing. And... Uh, did that change the dynamic between our male bonding? <laughs> it did. I had to show off. <laughs> Do you think it did? I don't know. I definitely was. Is it coincidence that I played one of the best games I've played? <laughs> like I was not misclicking. I was like so focused. Was I trying to show off? Maybe. I mean, I think it changed the dynamic, you know, uh, yeah. because when it's just the four of us guys, it feels safer yeah (laughs) and uh not to make sexist jokes or anything no 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 Um, because we 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 are actually not like that yeah uh but it just feels i don't know i i just feel i don't i I just think that it's a part of it was just that there was a spectator yeah but i do have to recognize in i didn't feel it in the moment but after the game i was like i felt like i was trying to show off a little bit right because I was like, yeah, I, I got those guys. And yeah, I like. I don't know. I can't know if this is what I was motivated by, but I found myself wisecracking a little bit more. Mm-hmm. You know, trying to trying to make her laugh. Right. Um, <laughs> which is like, it's so hilarious because we don't know this person. Right. It's a voice. She barely said anything. On the yeah. Thing, but we're automatically like, Poop. oh yeah, we gotta. Perform. Yeah, 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 <laughs> and. So there's some negative sides of that and some just neutral sides. But I I think uh, just talking about the male bonding is that, and of course, women can bond and anyone of any gender can bond. But I will say that I have had a number of experiences where I know or I can assume that, 
okay, we're, we're five dudes and we don't know each other that well, or I don't know some of these dudes, but I can kind of bank on you having a similar value of male bonding, right. of working together and harmony and getting along and doing something fun together. And I, I've had that experience many, many times in my life, yeah. you know, of, of, uh, expressing my masculinity through a uh, male friendship and through positive things because again these things cut both ways because we and many people male bond in negative ways too in toxic ways as well yeah um just some other random things you know being funny of, of course women can be funny and women are funny um in fact all the comedy books that i've bought uh that i've liked were by women amy schumer um Amy Poehler, Lauren Graham, Lindy West, and the one comedy book that I bought by a man I was really met about, which is um, Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld's most recent comedy book. Mm. It was just like, it was tone deaf a couple times. I was what like- What is he trying to, is it trying to teach you to be funny or just talking about his experiences? Um, a lot of the what comedy writers, comedy comedians will do when they write a book is it'll be like part memoir, like kind of like part long form stand up mm. routine. You know what I mean? Like you could imagine them telling a story on stage and making everyone laugh. But, and it's sort of like that. But also he has like, he fills the book with all these little quips that he- because he's kind of a short joke stand-up comic, you know? Very, yeah. And and so he has all these ideas that he's written in a book, and so he just kind of says them. Mm. Anyway. Um, so anyway, I think that being... I feel like I can express my masculinity, uh, particularly in groups. Through humor. Through humor. Another is heroic behavior, you know, like... Yeah. In a extreme example, like disarming a mass shooter, for example. Right. I, I could imagine... Um, like actually when I was a kid, I would fantasize daydream about protecting our school from like a mass shooter. Like mm -hmm. I, I would sacrifice myself, you know, when I was a kid, I remember in, in war movies, the good guy, like the really courageous guy would jump on the grenade. Mm. Do you remember this scene? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a, a live grenade lands in the foxhole and the courageous manly guy kills himself to save his buddies. Right. And uh, now, of course, you know, we don't have to take it that far, but, but heroic behavior, like, I don't know, like, oh, I don't want to go into specifics, but I will say as a professor, there are times when I see students who are being mistreated by the university, or at least it seems that way. Right. They're being mistreated by my colleagues, I think. And I don't know if I frame it as heroism, but that I feel masculine stepping in strong, tall, with my chin up and saying, right. you can't do that to this student. Yeah, so this is the mirror of what I was talking about fairness. Like my my uh, box for it is this term fairness. You're, you're calling it heroism, but I think there, there's like aspects of it. But I, I totally sympathize with that because it's it's this idea of like, wait a minute, this can't stand. Right. And so, sure, in some case, in the extreme case, it might be like, wait, it's not right that this person is coming and shooting us. So I'm going to go, yeah, but that's the extreme. But the more common case is like, well, you shouldn't be able to talk to them like that. Yeah. I'm going to step in. Right. And But, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the way that I'm framing it as heroism is that, like I said, I'm standing tall and I'm standing proud, and I'm right. and I don't need to do this. Like right. I, there's this doesn't impact me at all. Yeah. But I see someone in distress, yeah. and I I run into the burning fire, and sure. I might even get singed, you yep. know. But it's like that's what I feel like strong men do. That's you know, what they got to do. Yeah, loyalty, honor. Again, these things can go both ways. Leadership, providing for others, uh, being a fun dad. You know, being a good father, I think, is another positive, yeah. obviously positive masculine thing. So let's read some things um, on the internet. Um, this episode is going to be long, bro. It already is long. <laughs> um, I'm just going to read a couple. Because I just want to give people the 
uh, landscape that we live in. <laughs> because I'm sure I'm guessing a lot of you listening right now are like nodding your head uh, to a, maybe I hope a lot of this um, <laughs> of just like you know the general notion of feminism and toxic masculinity, but. On Twitter, an American conservative radio host, of which I won't name because I don't want to give him any kind of plug, uh, said the following. When you wage war on toxic masculinity, you create a society where a woman can get raped on a train in Philadelphia for 40 minutes and not a single man will stand up and do something about it. This was tweeted by a famous American conservative radio host. When you wage war on toxic masculinity... You create a society where a woman can get raped on a train in Philadelphia for 40 minutes and not a single man will stand up and do something about it. Berto, what do you think? Yeah, it's just a fundamental misunderstanding of what we are talking about. Right. We just spent all this time saying like, hey, there's all these positive male traits. Right. And um, look, in the episode that no one will hear where you and I got in a, a debate, one of the points was if someone came and was aggressive and, and you were there, would you stand up and try to like do something about it? And there's this, the dark side of it, which is, oh, I'm male, I must uh, puff my chest. And then there's this, what I'd hope is the lighter side that we're talking about, which is, let's be fair, let's be just, let's, let's stand up for the, for the underdog, let's stand up for the oppressed, all these things. So this example, like any one of us that is on this side of the movement that would say, like the, the rape is one of the worst examples of toxic, toxicity. Right. It, that's the first thing we would jump onto. Right. <laughs> and so what I don't understand is, I, I do understand because I, I see where their crazy logic is going. They're saying, look, because you're pushing this agenda, you're going to make boys into girls. Which is and like, when what? They're in that train, those boys are going to be too afraid and feminized, so they're not going to stand up to the rapist. Right. Right. And what they're misunderstanding is that we are mostly, at least us, I can't speak for everyone, we are trying to trade traits. <laughs> yeah. Here's, I'll accept, it's like a trade-in program. Come in, bring in your harassment, I'll give you this justice. You know? yeah, yeah. And so it's like, in that case, like, no, of course, we'd be like, the first ones to step in. Yeah. <laughs> and I would argue that traditional masculinity had a lot of positive things in it that have become to some extent, more toxic. Uh, I mean, of course, there was toxic masculinity in the past. But in, I don't know. I just feel like yeah, I remember, yeah, yeah. I remember yeah. men being men, like, in, in real life, not in movies and TV. And they were actually not harmful or unfair to other people as often as I think the the conservatives would like to think we're supposed to be. Do you know what I'm well, saying? Well, I, I think so. I, I will say this too. So they set up a straw man argument anyways, right? right? Like, But let's take a different question. So if you don't oppose toxic masculinity and you're in a boardroom late at night, there's two men and a woman and one man starts groping the woman and the woman seems sort of into it, but seems uncomfortable. What should happen? Because this isn't rape on a bus or anything. It's just late at night. Guys would be guys. She seems sort of into it. They're drinking. It's fine. That's what we're talking about. They, they, this is where, when we're having these conversations, we'd say like, no, the other guy should say, hey, this is not okay. That's being a strong male in that case. Right. What is not, it, what is being toxic is being like, hey, what's up? It's fine. She was sort of into it. I right. mean, she was drunk, but who cares? You know, Or looking the other way. Or looking the other way. Because yeah. boys will be boys. Yeah. That's what we're talking about. Right. So you're pretending like... I just had something fall <laughs> off my... <laughs> something. Anyway. You're pretending, not you, the, this conservative person, is pretending like, oh, they're always rushing into boardrooms late at night and stopping harassment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So first off, what happened was there was a there was a rape in Philadelphia, and it was on a train, and the uh, you know conservative discourse was that no one did anything because it fits their narrative, which is that men are becoming women, as if women wouldn't step in. By the way, and two that people in cities like Philadelphia are immoral right, you know that's right, their right. narrative it's like right. city folk democrats 
have no morals. Right. You know, they're baby killers or whatever the yeah. f. But that isn't what happened. Um, it it's not like a bunch of you know soy boys were cowering in the corner of the train. It, when, when you read the actual story, um, it it's it's not like there were a bunch of uh, you know feminist men like afraid to step in. It was a rape did occur. Hardly anyone knew it was happening because it was it wasn't very under noticeable to other people. You know that kind of thing. And I think people did do things about it. You yeah. know what I mean? So anyway. Um, yeah, I think the picture they have in their mind is, and by the way, was the rapist a soy boy? Right. <laughs> no. Let's let's clarify this picture. Yeah. The rapist is an alpha male giving it to this woman who should take it. And he's pointing to all the beta cucks going, what? You can't do anything about it because you've been feminized. Right. Wait, so is that good? Right. <laughs> Yeah. Is the alpha male cool in that situation? Right, right. And <laughs> even if, uh, yeah, yeah, it's just a straw man because they're they have a political Cause, agenda. Because uh, let me take it the other way. Let's say they said no, no, no. Well, no, the rapist is also a beta cuck. Oh well, then shouldn't the other beta cucks just outnumber the one beta cuck? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, so um, just kind of rattling off uh, some of the results of toxic. We've gone into a lot, but research has shown that sexual assault on others is a effect of toxic masculinity. Essentially what they look at is they ask people about their attitudes and the more toxic masculine attitudes they ascribe to, and they also will measure criminal activity or blah, 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 and find that people with more toxic masculine values are more likely to sexually assault and rape other people. Mm -hmm. um, also, it's been found that this has a effect on our self-esteem as men because you know we're not ripped with a six pack or you know penis um shaming happens a lot uh all sorts of things that men will be shamed for and they'll develop body issues they might use steroids eating disorders men can suffer from absolutely feeling like they're not a real man because you know if you're short say say you're five two and you're, you know, 140 or 130 pounds or something. Uh, and uh, you'll be seen as like not a real man sometimes, yeah. you know? And it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. So we could see how there'd be, you know, uh, uh, self-esteem issues. Also, as I was saying earlier, men don't seek help. They die earlier, more suicides, among other sorts of effects. Mental health, they, they seek mental health much less often. Denial of needs, attachment needs, emotional needs, cuddling needs, care for, you know, care from others, medical needs. Also, violence and crime. So, Birdo, um, well, actually, let me tell a story about violence and crime and toxic masculinity that anthropologists, sociologists will point this out as well, is that when you take a group of people, like a, a population, mm -hmm. And that identifies as something and you disenfranchise them, you know, in society, then they're more likely to ascribe to toxic masculinity and they're more likely to uh, want to establish them, you know, because if you feel like society sees you as lesser and you're and yeah. you and your people are being oppressed and you and your people are being depowered. Mm hmm. And you're you're losing out on the goodies of life. You're seen as a loser, and one fast track to self esteem is hypermasculinity. Yeah, I will become so masculine and so clearly a a better man than even those in power. Right. Then at least I can have some self esteem, and the road to hypermasculinity is paved with toxic masculinity right <laughs> it's violence it's rape it's non-emotionality it's not at, it's really not asking for help right yeah so when i would treat um you know families uh back in the day i would treat a lot of gang members a lot of teenager and young adult uh girls and boys in gangs and I found it was so different from the way I grew up, you know, because right. that's just, I came from suburbia, I was like completely just divorced from my understanding. Like, why would you, I understand wanting to have friends for sure, but having guns and shooting people up and for what, yeah. you know, because, because the, the public discourse is like, well, they're in gangs because of drug dealing. And certainly that can be a thing. 
But a lot of the people I treated who were in gangs, they were in gangs for bonding and for hyper masculine, for uh, trying to establish some kind of self esteem in a world that saw them as nothing. Yeah. You know, they were going to, with violence and crime and their own sense of freedom, like not going to school, establish themselves as worthy human beings in their own world. And the gang, the upper gang echelon would prey upon young people who were looking for that sort of thing. Anyway, so one story, I was treating this one kid, a Mexican immigrant family, and he was smart and funny and interesting. And when, you know, when we would have sessions, he just seemed like a, just a regular, sweet 15 year old kid. But you know, he would talk about how we, he was in a gang. And he's like, well, you know, everyone, all the other Mexican immigrant right. boys are in gangs in Seattle. And that's just how it is. It's just, you know, you gotta, you gotta play the game. And then one day I get a call that he got shot at, at the mall, actually Northgate mall. Oh my gosh. And my next session with him, he's talking to me. He's like, Oh, I got a bullet through, got a couple bullets through the legs and it, it caught an artery and I was bleeding out <clears throat> and I had to have all these surgeries and my, my calf muscle is all messed up and, and I don't want to be in gangs anymore. That was awful. And so I, so this is when he started really opening up in therapy, you know, and I'm like, well, you know what happened? And, you know, so he's telling me, he's like, well, we're at the mall and we had heard that this other group this other gang was, it wasn't even really a gang gang. They, you know, the, a lot of the gangs in Seattle anyway, were what they called them crews. And it was just like eight people. And it wasn't like a part of like the Crips, you know what I mean? It was like just eight kids who glommed together in this, Hmm. in this gang, you know, violent, uh, they just had a a makeshift gang. (laughs) Yeah. And maybe it would get passed down through generations. I don't know. But anyway, so, He's telling me about his crew was in a fight with with another crew, and uh, someone had heard that someone called someone like a bad name, like an a hole oh, or something. Man. And they're all at Northgate Mall, and so uh, you know there was some sort of inter. This is before Twitter, so it's some sort of intermediary, like maybe some friend of a friend says, yeah. "Well, you know, they said you're, you know, so and so said you're an a hole," oh, and then boy. and they are well. Those guys are a bunch of bitches. And then that gets back to them. It escalates over the span of a few hours at the mall yeah. to the point where uh, the other gang gets in their car, gets all their guns as they're, and drives by the food court, which all of them are in, and just, and just shoots oh into the food gosh. court. Just da 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 in, into the crowd. Into the Northgate Mall. Into the Northgate Mall. Oh, my God. My client gets hit and almost dies, goes to the hospital. And now he's like, oh I don't want to be in a gang anymore. And it, it occurred to me, because in my head, you know, the, from the movies like New Jack City or whatever, yeah. Colors, a lot of this, the gang activity, it seemed more important. Like the things that you got in fights about, yeah. they seemed like... They're trying to steal our territory. Yeah, like economic. And certainly yeah. that can happen. But I heard... so I, This was the... And maybe it was just the gang members I talked to, but every single time there was a beef... It was essentially just the same bullshit you find. He said, she said. Yeah, at school. Like, yeah. you know, some, you're just having, you have a rivalry with someone yeah. or someone talk crap about you. And the difference is with most people, they don't shoot. <laughs> you know, they just wow. they just continue to talk crap about the other person. Maybe yeah. you'll get into a fist fight. But, but with these gangs that, you know, immediately turned to death and wow. destruction. And, and so... He's telling me about us, and and I was like, wow. All of that, just for your own toxic masculinity. Yeah. All of that, you know? And, and he knew going into it, like, well, as he's like, yeah, as we were escalating, he, this isn't his words, but he knew that someone could die. Yeah. And I'm like, at what point did you not just pull the plug and go home? Yeah. Who cares what those other douchebags are saying about you? It's not worth it. He's like, but I didn't want to be a bitch. Yeah. And it's like, we indoctrinate our children into that mindset, you know, of do not be a bitch. And just that word, right? Bitch. It's like, it's a yeah. woman, right? Like you as a guy, it's like, you don't want to be a woman. You don't yeah. want to be a woman who has to sell her body for money. Yeah. So... 
it was astounding to me. And uh, so many examples of how masculinity will lead to crime, essentially, and destruction and death. And so just to, and also research shows that men with toxic masculine attitudes are much more likely to commit intimate partner violence, which makes total sense. In fact, when I treated DV perpetrators about, I don't know, a third of what I was doing for the perpetrators was de-educating them about toxic masculinity, yeah. about male entitlement. A big part of DV perpetrator motivation is I'm the man. It's like, let's let's change that narrative you know what i mean like it doesn't give you the right to beat her and it doesn't mean you're supposed to you know yeah. and it's okay to say that you're she hurt your feelings you don't have to punch her in the face to tell her that she hurt your feelings you know you know i just had a realization which is obvious but uh the worst insults in english and spanish that you can do to a guy right yeah you are a son of a bitch right like the worst thing I can say about you is that your mom is is a bitch. <laughs> right. It's like not about you. It's about your mom. It's got to be about the mom, the female. <laughs> yeah. Like it's it's crazy. Yeah. When you when you really pay attention to the even just like playful ribbing that you'll you know do, guys yeah. will do like it, it, a coach would walk in to the locker room and say, "Hey, ladies, you know, settle yeah. down," or. Or when they're trying to motivate us, it's like, are you women or are you men? Yeah. You know, let's, don't be a woman. Don't be a girl out there. Be a man. It's just like, why does it have to be framed that way? And like, <laughs> like, it's un unbelievable. Like, is there one insult? Like, you shithead, maybe. But nothing is as strong as you motherfucker. Yeah. You son of a bitch. Like, the insult I can levy towards you has something to do with a woman. Yeah. That either you're doing something bad to or they did something and now they have you. Right. It's so crazy. Right. So men account for what percentage of homicides? Um, in the States, 70%? Yeah, yeah US. 90. 90%. Uh, what percentage of those arrested with forcible rape are men? With forcible rape? Um, okay, 85%. 99. 99%. Percentage arrested for embezzlement? Um, 80%. 51. Okay. So that's not apparently influenced by masculinity because it's yeah. like 50 50. That's that, uh, earlier, that's why I was saying that, like, um, as humans, I think we're all taught that we should win at all costs. Hmm. Percentage of those arrested for offenses against family and children? Family and children? Uh, 60? 80. 80. Um, research has found that, and you know, th so they came up with all these percentages based on some speculation but uh, and data. But anyway, if we get rid of toxic masculinity, we could, re we could reduce what percentage of sexual violence? Oh, maybe cut it in half. Uh, more than 69%, according to nice. these people. Uh, percentage of traffic accidents. <laughs> Road rage. Uh, maybe uh, how much we can get rid of? Yeah. Yeah, maybe we get rid of 50%. Yeah, 41%. Um, along those lines, as a, when I was younger, a teenage, when I was 16, I first got my license, I, I don't, I'm not sure if this is where it came from, but it could have. A manifestation of my toxic masculinity was driving, l like, dangerously. Yeah. At, with people in the car. Yeah. I, or I with this. people not in the car, and then I would tell people about it. Yeah, I remember this was a thing. Yeah, and I almost mm. killed me and my friends a couple times Ugh. by playing like chicken, chicken essentially, like or that, yeah. or you know just speeding through a red light. I mean, Footloose has a whole scene where they're playing chicken. Yeah, yeah, and a real man doesn't does, is 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 not afraid of that. Which, know? by the way, this is why Back to the Future is one of my favorite series. We talk about positive male role models. Yeah. So he's a, you know, great guy. And yeah. what does he do? He like, he has friends, he's friends with a scientist, he travels through time, but what does he not do? He does, he steps, you know, he steps in to help, but he also doesn't have to take the bait. Right. And he's like, are you gonna race me and be dangerous? No, actually I'm not.
Yeah. So just rattling off a whole bunch of other things I came up with that are, you know, there's so many negative things that are a result of toxic masculinity, but obviously you have misogyny and sexism and the incels and the mig- MGTOWs and um, men are more likely to go to prison actually because of motivated by masculinity. Depression is higher for men uh, or, or a lot of depression can be caused um, by masculinity, stress, substance abuse. A lot of men will, you know, suppress their feelings through substance abuse, poor social functioning, mansplaining, man spreading. That's another thing. Um, spreading COVID, for example, this is anecdotal that at the beginning of the pandemic, I had this group of what I'm going to call former friends who almost right away were like, uh, well, we're going to still get together, right? Uh, in our, you know, 15 men yeah. group thing. Um, because, you know, I'm not worried about it. I'm I'm not afraid, you know, that. And if I of, get sick, so be it. Right. And um, I wasn't like that. Right. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. And I was like, yeah, I'm not going. That's, that's just not going to happen. And um, I mean, they ended up canceling it in the end, but uh, it seemed highly motivated by this masculine show of I'm not afraid of of COVID you know it's like yep. it's not a matter of fear it's a matter of respect of you know I, I'm not you can you're fine you, I'm not you could say you're never afraid but you know a bullet to the head is still a bad thing you know what <laughs> I mean? so uh, sexism in the workplace you could say Elliot Roger and a lot of those people are a result of toxic <laughs> by the way like I used to get made fun of this all the time by friends that you know for like, I didn't want to eat the carbonized part of the chicken or whatever it was. It's like, oh, come on. You stop being such a, you know. <laughs> Pussy. Yeah. Also, I've been demonized for the kinds of drinks I order. If I drink a fufu drink with like a little umbrella and well, very I'll, citrusy. I'll never do that. I'll never make fun of you for that. <laughs> but but also, also, I'll, 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 I see people making fun of you for that. I'm just yeah. like, really? Yeah. Like the, the, and, the fact and, that there are man drinks and women drinks. So, so that's another thing. Like I, I love white wine. I mean, I don't love white wine, but I, I, in my later years, I like white wine more than red wine. And, and right. when I go to the uh, restaurant, me and Stacy, um, and we order drinks and I order white wine, they, they'll put the white wine in front of my, my <laughs> wife yeah. because like, you're it, not supposed to be drinking. Wine. But how dumb is that? Well, and here's white the thing. wine is just, is just um, green grapes. That's all that it is. It's not. It's it. Why are there? Why is there male and women um, wine? Yeah, yeah. So you were asking about what are some positive male traits, and actually, to me, one of the ones that I'm proud of myself, and that I, I, t- I take pride and I and I see it in and when I see it in men, I think that's admirable is in not feeling emasculated or threatened in my masculinity totally. for trivial, stupid stuff. Yeah, you've got to be really <laughs> insecure as a man yeah. to, to feel like your entire masculinity is dismantled by ordering a Cosmo at the bar. And I've, I, what, I've gotten such pleasure, this has happened to me many times in my life, where I show up at the party. I remember one time I showed up at the party with a, a kind of a pinkish lavender shirt and like a purple boa and at first, a couple guys are trying to make fun of me, like, oh, and then and then I feed right into it. I'm like, yeah, that's right, that's right. And they're like so puzzled that they can't make me feel feminized for it. And mm-hmm. then all the girls love it, and they're like, wait, what's happening? <laughs> and then I'm like, yeah, that's the way it goes. And I love it because I'm like, look, you dolts, yeah. that's not male, that doesn't make me a male or female. I'm just wearing funny stuff because I love it. Or I'm drinking this, Fufu drink because it tastes delicious to me. Or I'm standing on the stage and singing a karaoke song because I love singing. Right. And yeah, I'm that's not funny be to think back. By it. Yeah, that's funny to think back. Karaoke was a female thing oh, yeah. years ago. I mean, except it, like in the Asian community, no, but like in the but normal, it, <laughs> normal, sorry, that's not right. In the, <laughs> in the popular uh, American. American community, yeah. it was definitely seen as a. It, it, like if you were a, a macho guy, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do. get up there. And yeah, say, yeah. yeah. Um, hate crimes against LGBTQ people, a result of toxic masculinity, rape culture. We did a whole episode on that. Homophobia, gang violence, um, wars. You could say. I mean, you could argue a good percentage of of world wars or even small wars are 
uh, at least influenced by toxic masculinity of like, I will not be dominated and I will dominate. Yeah, it's certainly that's a huge component. Yeah. Let's go quickly over our top five toxic masculine characters. Berto, very quickly, number five. All right, so from movies and TVs, my number five is Biff Tannen from- Oh, that's my number three. Back to the Future. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like he's a cartoon character, but actually not far from the truth, right? right. The guy's hyper masculine, big, buff, probably plays football, whatever, right? Bullies. And then bullies and basically tries to rape the, the woman. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you, you could argue he did rape her without- I mean, Yeah, without he was, going... and he was expecting that this was within his purview. Like, right. Yeah. Number four, Patrick Bateman. Oh, okay. Patrick Bateman represents so many aspects of this because he is like in Wall Street and, you know, it's like uh, morality is not for the powerful man. From, and, which, from which movie is this? Uh, uh, American Psycho. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, number three, this is my Tywin Lannister. Yeah. So I, I debated with myself. I certainly thought, well, no, I mean, to me, I don't want to just mention like a monster because that's just maybe a psychopath or something. Right. You know? I thought Tywin Lannister is like represents that, like I'm the man, I'm in charge, my lineage will be in charge, not the woman, she'll be like married to someone, but my lineage will be in charge. It's all about my male heir and all these things. And of course it wasn't just him. No. But he's one of like the, the worst examples of it yeah. in that sense. And, and I wanted him because in fact, he, does, he doesn't come off as a monster necessarily. Like, in the context of the world in which they live in. Yeah, he was right? totally normal. Right. And yet, that is where we come from. And going off of my fear-based motivation in the books, we know that Tywin grew up in a family with a father who was considered weak by uh, mm. society. And there were rival houses lesser houses mm -hmm. you know lannister goes way back you know yeah and there were rival minor houses who were legitimately threatening the lannister house you know overthrowing and and taking over castle rock oh, and wow. and all that stuff and and little tywin was watching his father get um less and less power and then and and learned that in order to be safe and to keep your family safe and your legacy safe, which is a big deal to people during feudal times in the, you know, uh, aristocracy, you have to, and you have to create fear. Yeah. That's the only thing right. that will keep you in power because if people are afraid of you, they won't threaten you. And so there's that. And the fact that he couldn't form emotional bonds with his children, yeah. especially not the ones that were most disappointing. Yeah. And, that was his demise. <laughs> right. All right. Number two, Baron Harkonnen <laughs> from the <laughs> Dune series. Baron Harkonnen is like, again, one of these examples. Sure, he might also be a psychopath, but I actually, I like that in this movie, um, he is presented less of a psychopath, as less of a psychopath than in the David Lynch movie. Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I've been listening to the book on, on tape. Is it good? It's, it is really good. And actually, I'm Is it surprised. easy to follow? Because I was worrying it, about it. It is, oh, okay. at least so far. But I'm actually surprised how close both the Lynch and this movie actually are to, to the story. Oh. Now, up until now. And I, I'm at the point where uh, Paul and his mom are in the desert right now. Okay. But anyways, Baron Harkonnen, this like male, and he values like the male strength, his male lineage, and everyone must be oppressed. And in the book, same thing. Like, in the book, fear. does he rape boys like he did in the Lynch, yeah. Lynch version? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But I think that's something they took out of this one because that is a trope that I think they were probably trying to not emphasize, which Absolutely. is if you're the bad guy, of course, you're going to be a homosexual probably. Well, and in the Lynch version, Harkonnens were, were gingers. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyways, my number one. Which I'm saying is another trope. Yeah, it's another trope. Like redheads yeah. are evil. Like. Is evil, and he's homosexual. Yeah. Because in the book, oh, no, not, actually, they do mention boys. So I guess you would say he's kind of a pedophile, too. But okay. Uh, number one, Chad. So, so wait, wait, wait. Ah, uh, you, you do so much. You stomp on my number ones. Har Harkonnen <laughs> is gay and a pedophile or just a pedophile? 
they allude to the youths. That youth is so beautiful. I don't know how young they are. Do you, and I don't know he, what does he ever rules involve, they have in that universe. Does he ever get involved with an adult? The only thing they mention in the book so far is, oh, that youth is really beautiful. And in fact, he's kind of in love with Fader, who's like his nephew. Okay. And he's, but it's unclear how old or young these, oh, but they, you know, they had a boy slave that they had captured somewhere. We don't know how old he is, but he's like, bring him. And this time, drug him. I'm in no mood for a fight. Wow. See what I'm saying? So, so it's like. So we don't know how old they are. No, but he's at the very least raping and, and abusing these right. slaves. So, and they're younger. And... Yeah. Now, I, that part, fine, villainize him. I think, though, there was this aspect of like, oh, and he's gay. Right. Like, you know. All right. Um, number one, Chad from In the Company of Men. Oh, in the Company of Men is right. a Neil, Neil Laboot movie. And oh I haven't gosh, seen that in a long time. It's but... Aaron Eckhart. Yeah. And this should be framed. Everyone should watch this. It's the epitome of the toxic masculinity in the more real terms that we deal with it. Right. This guy is a stud and his friend is kind of nerdy and he just like is a horrible, horrible human being. Yeah. Sexist, everything. It's just horrible. Uses women. Absolutely. Wants Topher to use women. And with the males, he is manipulative and insulting and conniving yeah. so, and traitorous. So what's different and, about him just being a toxic person is that a lot of his motivations could be, it could be argued, we don't know, are expressions of masculinity. He's trying to yeah. assert himself as a manly person and in the effort of that, he is harming all sorts of people around him. And I, I, I'm surprised, was the term Chad already in existence way long ago? When you said that, I'm like, I wonder if that's where Chad came from. That's so crazy. Yeah. Because he's the But I don't think so. I don't think so because I, I think that I think that gives yeah. those people, because in Too much credit. <laughs> I think he gives them too much credit, okay. yeah. Because I think Chad, it, it just sounds, it's like, when in the 80s we would we would have said like chip like what dudes who were named kip or chip uh -huh. were rich white blonde guys you know yeah. what i mean uh, we i don't i'm pretty sure that's not true but yeah, that yeah, was our the stereotype. stereotype all right my list number five toxic masculine this is kind of a you know hard one for me to admit but the mandalorian right yes so in the beginning yeah. toward the end he yeah, yeah. he makes up for it but in the beginning he's non-emotional that's right hides his face, works alone, doesn't like to talk, doesn't care about his bounties, you know, doesn't list, doesn't think about the morality. Right, He's right. just here to do a job. Uh, by the end, obviously, he, he becomes yeah. a, a human being, um, which I think is, you know, part of the whole point of the show. Yep. Uh, number four is Dennis Reynolds from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot. Played by oh, Glenn yes. Howerton. You know, one of the things that I've realized so in recent years is that when I first started watching It's Always Sunny in what, like the, when would that have been when it first came out? 2005 like, or something? Okay. Yeah, when I first started watching it, I thought Charlie Day was the runaway star. I thought he was the funniest sure. person. I, and the other, I thought I saw Mac and Dennis as like sideshow, sort of like yeah, a support cast for Charlie Day's character. The more I watch of the show, the more I consider Dennis to be the, <laughs> the star. Dennis is awesome, and and Mac and Charlie are there to support his comedy. I mean, Dennis is a hilarious character. He is so good. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go as far as you're going, but I wouldn't be upset that you're going that far. At the very least, I demote Charlie's character to secondary. Sure, you're, he's not primary. To, you cannot call him primary. To, to Dennis and Mac at the very yeah, least, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so Dennis, he manipulates women. He uses women for sex. He needs to be in control. He acts non-emotional. He doesn't uh, listen to people. He drinks a lot, that kind of okay. And they treat D. <laughs> he right. treats D. Right. Always, His as, sister. <laughs> as a man, Frank, all the yeah. boys treat D terribly as a way of signaling to each other, we're men, <laughs> and she's a woman. Number three, Biff, Back to the Future. Number two, Tony Soprano. Yep. Tony Soprano, homophobic, or at least he acted homophobic to prove that he's a real man. He's very tough, uh, lacks compassion, treats his wife uh, 
poorly cheats on her a lot without any kind of remorse about it not emotional but he went to therapy well and it's and it's funny because like there's a case where there are some aspects that he shows uh, that he has potential to not always be so toxic right there are moments in we, where he tries to be an okay father or moments where he tries to be an okay husband it's just that the other traits end up winning almost every time yeah uh number one and i re- i love that i came up with this um the fawns from happy days interesting no i can't allow it but i see where you're going with it in the especially in the beginning of the run the fawns was super cool that was this whole thing yeah which basically means no emotions it, not only no fear or yes, pain but also true. no like excitement you know like the 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 true masculine clint eastwood character just doesn't ever have an emotion either way <laughs> you know it doesn't get excited doesn't get sad doesn't get afraid it's just kind of like always just cool but if you're gonna understand that the mandalorian evolved the fonts evolved fonts totally evolved i mean yeah. by the end of the run he was dressed in a like a i don't know what you call it like a, a blazer he was a teacher he yeah. was you know and and there were so many episodes where he was some of these things we were talking about standing up for the underdog all these kinds of things true he was doing that but listen to the, the, the he could not apologize that's true yeah <laughs> there were many scenes where he's he's supposed to apologize he and it was a huge played for laugh thing he couldn't you know i'm guessing most of you out there are too young to remember happy days but the fans would go i i he's supposed to say i'm sorry i this was this and then everyone would laugh but then that okay and you're right but but they are showing in that that he's got a a de- defect yeah. Because you're supposed to be able to. But then listen to this. Yeah. Always, especially in the beginning, had two voiceless hot Women ladies next, I know, yeah, yeah. On, on each arm. And he would snap. And he would snap yeah. and they'd run to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He could fix anything with a punch. I know, yes, yes. Uh, he could intimidate anyone just by looking at them. You know, it, there were so many toxic masculine <laughs> yeah. ideals wrapped up in the fawns. I won't disagree. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but I will disagree. <laughs> uh, positive masculine characters. Okay. Number five, Rocky Balboa. Interesting. So you think, oh, what? He's like a meathead punching dude, and he's a bodyguard for like the mob or something. Yeah. He's a collector. Okay, here. Hear me out. Yeah, he's a strong guy from a blue collar neighborhood. He doesn't have money and stuff. But guess what? The guy values friendship, he's nothing if not honest. He is, he, he is a man of his word, and he is so good to his woman, you know? And he's respectful to her, and, he's, and, and he stands up for Polly, who's abusive. Mm. You know, it stands up to Polly and stuff like that. Anyways, so Rocky, to me, is actually reflects a lot of positive male attributes in a strong package. Interesting. Yeah. Um, number four. Gomez from Adam's family. <laughs> Gomez is um, like great because he loves Morticia and he treats her awesome. Like he, he's so respectful. And it's not, they're equals. They, they're, they, they dance together. They have fun together. She's super smart as well. Like they're both very educated. So, so you know, the Adam's family emerged in the 60s. I think. Yes, I think so. And, Maybe even you know, the Munsters, it was a similar kind of thing. And, of course, these shows were just, you know, cartoon versions of American values, right? But the, So, okay, yeah. was it um, part of the abomination of this family that he wasn't like Mr. Cleaver and Leave it to Beaver? You know what I mean? Like, what, was it like... Oh my God! Look how weird this family is. I mean, the the, it, the it father is, be. is is being so doting on his wife. I mean, what kind of what kind of man is like that? To it us? could be. I think it's a show way ahead of its time because look, I like the monsters, but the monsters used the other the the um, antithesis of what was actually happening, which was the same thing the Flintstones did and the Simpsons yeah. did, the, which the, was the man is an idiot, right? And the and the wife is really, brilliant, really the one in charge. And it was like, well, no, that's 
not good either. Like you're going too far the other direction. Yeah. And the reason you're doing it and getting away with it, and it's funny, is because the reality is horrifically in the other direction that the man is uh, uh, controlling and abusive and the woman doesn't, uh, all these things. Okay. But the Adams family. And it excuses bad male behavior. Exactly. Right? But the Adams family was completely different. And you're right. Maybe it's part of the genius that that's the horror. But like they were a good couple, a healthy couple. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and actually, this has continued because recently they've put out these cartoon versions uh, and I watched both the first one and the second one. And again, they're a great couple. It's really positive. Okay, number three. Ready for the controversy bells. Bill Cosby from The Cosby Show. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, uh, What's so, his name? Uh, H- Huxtable. Huxtable. Cliff Doc- Huxtable. I Doctor. should clarify. Yeah. Because I didn't remember his name. So it's Cliff Huxtable. In the Cosby Show, yeah, the fact that it's played by Bill Cosby is you know, irrelevant. irrelevant. Yeah. It, the character was written, and and actually, I would I would even go I mean, there, for there's it. some there's some toxic elements though because if you watch that show, there's there's some there's some sexist things. I, I, that, I don't doubt it. It's a product of its age, absolutely. Yeah. But in the age, yeah. right? You know, several things like uh, a, a a person of color. I hate that term. Sorry, a a person who is not the standard Caucasian, right, is sitting there as a successful doctor, head of a family, good father, good husband, right, all these things. And yes, there, there are things of the era that were bad. And I'll actually go for, further to say that the tragedy of the whole Cosby story is that even in other things like Fat Albert and all these things, he portrayed so many of these good positive male values. So it's just like... Yeah. Incredibly tragic and ironic the way it all ended up. Yeah. Yeah. Number two, Mr. Rogers. Ah. Mr. Rogers, to me. Well, so that's interesting oh, because for me, when I was coming up with this list, and you could argue f- for it, but I was like, I don't want to just have a list of five good men. I want to have a list of men that are obviously exhibiting masculinity. You know what I mean? But In, I, right. in a positive way. You could make an argument that Mr. Rogers did. And that's what I'm doing. And But it is a little controversial because you would say, what are you talking about? He's like singing a little song and he takes his foofy little shoes off. I mean, I wouldn't say he's exhibiting femininity. I'm just saying that it's not like obviously masculine, you know? I'll tell you why for me it was masculine and it was positive. I mean, it's, I like that. Right, I, I, right. I, w- I wish that. Yeah. And I do. Uh, associate a lot of the things that Fred Rogers exhibited to be masculine, like being caring, being loving, listening, being well, soft. But there's other aspects that I think you'll see what I'm talking about. And because I watch this stuff so closely, some episodes, something breaks in the house and he goes and he takes it down and he explores it. And he's like, oh, I see what happened. And he shows you how he fixes it. Mm-hmm. Another case, there's a problem in the neighborhood of make believe. And he goes and he talks to them and he helps them mediate. Okay. Right? Another time, one of his neighbors has this problem and he goes and visits with her and listens. And it's like, it's not just the obvious things. There's these things that it's, he is being that male member of the community, helping, being helpful, being maybe mansplaining, but not in a mansplaining way, right? Like he's helping. Yeah. And so I looked at that and, and there are things that I don't necessarily have that I wish I had. Yeah. You know? he, when he would go to locations, yeah. he was in control, but not dominant. Yeah. He was assertive, but he listened. Right. You know, he was very strong, yeah. but not, uh, you know, constantly insecurely trying to assert his dominance. All and the knowing that he was in reality, he was like uh, in in the army or the Marines or something, you know. Anyways, he, he was... A man's man. You know? Okay. Okay. And lastly, number one, Superman. Oh my God, that's my number one. Talk to me about it. <laughs> well, so mine is Christopher Reeves' stop Superman. Yeah. Particularly, that's what I mean. Yeah, we because that's what I mean. Uh, the way it's been portrayed by the other Henry Calville um, is fine, but it there's not a lot of personality there. Yeah. No, I'm talking about. Christopher, well, I'm talking about the archetype and specifically the Christopher Reeves. Superman. Right, the archetype, you know, the, the 50s TV show. Yeah. Uh, but particularly Christopher, Christopher Reeves, Reeves, though, because he's a true hero. Yep. No macho posturing. Nope. 
he was courteous and helpful and humble. Yeah. Um, even when he was Superman, not just as Clark as the wimpy Clark Kent, but as Superman, he, you know, was kind and 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 the the epitome of the positive masculinity is he's in Lex Luthor's pool with a, a necklace of kryptonite around his neck, and he shouts out to Mrs. Te- Tessmacher, uh, Lex Luthor's assistant. He asks a woman for help, and she and he's begging her. He's just like, "Please help me," yeah. you know, like help me. And yeah. he's he's defense and. He didn't need to posture right. against. He nope. didn't, as soon as she takes the thing off, he doesn't go like, "Ah, get yeah. out of my way." He's yeah. just like, "Thanks, yeah. you know that." And I've got to go. And um, he doesn't brag. He always tells the truth. He he's not. He doesn't try to use aggression. You know. And he, this goes with your, by the way, your jingoistic, positive jingoistic message earlier: truth, justice, and the American way. Right. That's what Superman exhibited. That's what Superman exhibited helping get the cat out of the tree, getting the criminal. This yes. is the American way. Yes, you know, uh, would Superman march for Black Lives Matter? You, of course, you bet he would. You know what I mean? Of course. And so, Christopher Reeves, Superman, number one, most positive, and you cannot deny. You can't. That dude's masculine. That dude is masculine. Also, I was upset with Superman too, even as a child, because. They, they do something that actually hurts this thing we're talking about. In Superman 2, he loses his powers for a while, remember? Yeah. And he's in that cafe, and then this bully like is, is trying to bully him or someone, and he tries to stand up, and he gets beat up because he's not Superman, and he doesn't, he's unfortunately over-relied on his strength. He doesn't actually know how to fight, and he gets beat up. Okay, fine. I was, as a child, somewhat disappointed that Clark Kent didn't at least try, but fine, fine. But there is no character arc because later in the movie, it is when he's regained his powers that he comes back and he and he deals with that. Mm-hmm. And I wish that it would have been a different angle. Like he realizes that he, he doesn't need the strength to deal with a bully situation like that, uh. right? So I was always disappointed by that. But it's a small point. Superman 1, Superman, Christopher Reeves, that's the key. Yeah. My list, uh, number five, is Chiron from Moonlight. So yeah. uh, the main character, uh, we see him as a kid, as a tween, as a teen, and then as an yeah. adult. And the whole movie is is about masculinity, and it, yep. and it really touched me deeply when I saw it. I remember just walking out of the theater just completely uh, altered. Yeah, so um, good. And then we had the Oscar party, of yeah, course. Yeah, and I won. Yeah. So, so just a little story <laughs> of this. So, if you, if people remember, at, so I have an Oscar party every year, and and everyone at the party like tries tries to guess who's going to win, and whoever gets the most points wins the prize. And so it all came down to this last: if La La Land won, then Taryn won. Yep. And if Moonlight won, then you won. And I win, right? And when they, they when they announced uh, when what's his face read the card. La he, la land. he said La La Land and then they, they, they took that back and they give it they gave it to Moonlight. Um and I have it all on camera, it's pretty funny. <laughs> it's but anyway, so, awesome. so um and it was a big moment at the party is the point. It's yeah. like everyone you know, half the room was like, Oh my god, and then all of a sudden boom, this whole other thing anyway, big upset. <laughs> yeah. Um so Chiron is courageous against massive homophobia. He is emotional, expresses pain, he survives. He stays true yeah. to himself as a gay man through thick and thin uh, against massive oppression and, and violence. Um, allows himself to be himself in the end, for, forgives his mother, uh, seeks physical warmth from Kevin, uh, there's, and you know is sensitive uh, in a courageous way. So Chiron, Moonlight. Number four is Henry Fonda's character in 12 Angry Men. Ironically. The Fonz, Henry Fonda. (laughs) So Henry Fonda's character, if you haven't seen 12, I recently rewatched 12 Angry Men. It is, it holds up. It is so good. Um, Basically Henry Fonda. So 12 jurors, they, they, they watch this trial and they, and it's a person of color, by the way, a brown person being accused of, of murder. They go into the deliberation room and the, Everyone's like, oh, he's guilty. Of course he's oh, okay. I don't I don't really know, but who cares? Let's just say he's guilty and go home. 
And Henry Fonda's character is like, um, wait a minute, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't think so. And so he drags everything to a stop. Yeah. And he stands up. He does. He doesn't get aggressive. People get aggressive with him. Yeah. He doesn't insult people. And he, it'd be so much easier for him to just shut up and go with it. Yeah. Or to lose his shit and just yeah. yell at people. Yeah. It's, he's, he's principled. He's he's methodical. He's thoughtful. He's courageous. He he he's principled. You know intelligent not yeah. arrogant he doesn't give in to peer pressure he he's a leader by example and eventually he convinced the entire room all yeah. 12 to agree with him spoiler alert. number three aragorn from lord of the rings oh, among among several other characters in lord of the Rings. yeah totally aragorn is heroic he's not macho in the movies anyway in the books you could argue he's a little macho but in the movies played by uh, yeah, Viggo Mortensen. Yeah, that's true. He is very much not needing the spotlight. Yeah. And he's not, um, he doesn't need to be dominant over no. women. Uh, Ar- Arwen, go- you know, goes to save Frodo and Aragorn is like, well, wait. And, and she's like, no, I got to go. And he's like, oh, and he's like, yeah, okay. You know, he, yeah. you could argue that's a little toxic, but at the same time, it's like, he cares about her. He doesn't yeah, want her to get course. hurt. Um, and, uh, you know, a more toxic dude to be like, no, I'm going to go, that kind of thing. Um, but Arwen has more power than he does. Yeah. <laughs> I think he understands that. Um, stands by his word, self-sacrificial, shows his emotions. Uh, number two is Sean uh, in Goodwill Hunting, played by Robin Williams. The oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Good one. You know, because this is interesting, because on one hand, you're just like, well, is that really super masculine? But if you watch the movie... Uh, it's written and Robin Williams plays it this way. He's pretty masculine. He's pretty very he's, masculine. He's kind of a like a tough macho guy. In fact, it's that it borderlines with that gray area when he tries to choke his patient. Out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. uh, Will, played by uh, Matt Damon, is like pushing his buttons. Yeah, and Sean is you know he's just like fuck you. You're not going to do that. You know right. what I mean? And 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 physically stops him from doing. But he encourages emotions. Um, he's helpful. He's a good mentor. He's wise. Yeah. He's he's um, he's thoughtful. He listens well. He can kind of bro down with Will a little bit yeah. with story stuff. So, and then my number one is Superman. But I thought that was kind of fun to come up with, like yeah, it was five positive masculine <laughs> characters, you know. And so we can hold up Mister Rogers, Superman, Aragorn, yeah. Sean from Goodwill yeah. Hunting. And the others, and we can say "f you" to early Fonz, uh, <laughs> Biff, Biff, <laughs> Biff, <laughs> and uh, Tony Soprano, and others. Yeah. And everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.